prep this live by giving you guys massive advance notice. So it's good to see a couple of you uh, made it. Uh, Nisi, hey Jealousy, Paddy, Amy Hall, Stephanie, good to see you as well. Uh, got a message from Stephanie saying um, I'm, I'm uploading an audio book onto, onto Patreon. She says she's not going to listen to it. She's going to use, she's kind of going to, I think, going to binge listen um, on her way to CrimeCon. Um, use that as a way of, um, you know, uh, enjoying the flight or pre being, um, being entertained as sort of like flight entertainment kind of thing. So um, I thought that was quite interesting. I'm actually going on a little getaway myself, so I'm going to have to pre-record chapters because I record a chapter every day. I'm going to have to pre-record a couple of chapters, um, you know, like two chapters a day for a couple of days so that they cover the period that I'm away. Um, fortunately, there are a couple of short chapters coming up, so that should be easy. Hey, Jealousy, thanks for that. Um, Corporal Deb, good to see you. Susan Becker, good to see you as well. So, um, so what we're going to deal with in this final episode, it's the 15th and final live, can you believe it, on um, not just the murder of Vincent van Gogh, but also uh, what we've kind of been doing all this time is interrogating this narrative, right? And I think the, the, the brief really comes into its own in this particular episode because now it's a case of now I, now I really need to prosecute the case, although to some extent I've been, um, what's the word, interpreting, reviewing, analyzing, looking at um, Martin Bailey's version, sort of extending on it, elaborating on it, to some extent undermining it, to some extent agreeing with it. Now we reach the point where we sort of prosecute the case. It's a little bit like the Morphew case where you sort of say, um, what is suspicious about our suspect? What facts do we have to support dishonesty? What motive could he possibly have? What, what happens in the post-truth of the story? What is the post-truth of the story? What, um, uh, what, what meat and potatoes can we sort of throw into the bowl and say, uh, you know, this is our, these are our heads of argument kind of thing, right? In other words, how do we prosecute this idea that Dr. Geshe is a, a suspect and possibly they are even accessories to something that he could have done. And something that I thought of just in the period between the last episode and this episode, a thought just kind of occurred to me, did Paul Gachet Jr. have a wife? Did Paul Gachet get married, right? Did Marguerite Gachet get married. So you have the circumstances of Van Gogh's death. So you have whatever they were. So you have Van Gogh dies, their father is involved, meaning goes there, tends to him, goes to the funeral. That's what I mean by involved. And then and, and at that stage, the kids are like, Paul Gachet is like a teenager, he's about 17 years old. And Marguerite is about 21 years old. So they're youngsters, and yet they never get married. In the same way that Van Gogh's death is a seminal moment for the revues, you know, they ultimately lose their inn, they have to move out of Auvers, they never recover in Auvers from the, the scandal, from the, the, the disaster of a, a patron, of a, a guest, um, committing suicide in their, in their restaurant, in their, not in their restaurant, in their um, uh, hotel, basically. In the same way that that changes their lives permanently and completely, 
it also changes the gachet's lives but in a totally different way. But the part that I think is quite interesting is that um, they are quite young. You know, the kids are quite young. And yet it seems to change their lives completely as well. But why, why would it? Why should it? Why does Marguerite never get married? Why does Vincent give her the portrait that he painted of her? Think about this. Um, this is certainly my theory, but we know for a fact that the original portrait of Dr. Gachet, Vincent gave to his brother, right? So in other words, the painting that is the most famous and expensive Van Gogh ever sold, Vincent actually gave to his brother. He didn't give to Dr. Gachet. There's a disputed second version, which Vincent may have painted and he may have given to Dr. Gachet, but I don't believe that he actually did. I believe that that's a fake. Um for the reasons that I've sort of said before. I have put up a YouTube video where I go through all the reasons for that, the strange colors, the discrepancies, the um, the derivative as the weak derivative aspect of it. The fact that even Paul Gachet Jr. says, well, I think the second version of my dad's the better painting when it obviously isn't. Um, so, um, so there's that aspect. So, you know, if you just, Consider the hypothesis that Vincent gives the paint, the, the self-portrait of Dr. Gachet to his brother, but the self-portrait, the, sorry, not the self-portrait, the portrait of Dr. Gachet to his brother, um, but then he gives the portrait of Marguerite to Marguerite. He gives it to her, and it's a big one. It's not like this little inky-dinky portrait. It's um, like a double canvas, and so he gives it to her. She keeps it. She hangs it above her bed. For years, and, um, and 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 then she ultimately never gets married. Um, and then you also have Paul, who so they both inherit the house after their father dies, and and then they sort of just live in that house where there's so much history, and the memories of Van Gogh as well. And then is there more to it than that? So in this live. I'm going to take you through some of those ideas, rumors, speculation, but I'm not going to sort of, I'm not going to highlight that. I'm not going to kind of take you into my um, true crime um, hypothesis. I'm going to take you into what Martin Bailey says about it. So Martin Bailey is the art expert. This is Martin Bailey's version of Gachet's history. And so the question is, is this neutral um guy so this guy who says van gogh committed suicide these are the reasons is this neutral guy or is, is his story of gachet number one accurate number two if it's accurate can we draw something out of the out of potential dodginess in other words does martin bailey acknowledge potential dodginess to what extent does he acknowledge it and to what extent does that take us anywhere if if at all does that make sense so let's look at some of your comments um stephanie says they're all sleeping hopefully um by the way if you hear heavy breathing that's to me that is lying in my arms he always seems to see alive as cuddle time it is actually quite cold here um yesterday was pretty cold like 12 degrees so apparently snowing um in south africa it's quite weird it's i know it's snowing in france i think it was snowing recently in england as well um so it's weird that it's snowing at the change of seasons on both sides of the the, the world it's pretty bizarre um Axie says, Bailey only brushes on it lightly. He's not a true crime kind of guy. Well, as we're going to as we're gonna kind of see in this analysis, in his chapter, Father and Son, um, we've dealt with, I think, four or four, maybe four to six pages. There are another eight pages to, to go through. So although he deals with it somewhat lightly, it is... It is um, reasonably in depth. It is something that we can actually look at and use, right? Um, 
Corporal Deb says Paul and Vincent had a close but tumultuous relationship. Uh, right in the beginning, Vincent said, um, this guy is sicker than I am and he's not to be trusted. That was his first impression of him. Is that true? So another thing, before we get into the analysis and before I chuck um, Timmy out, because I've got to go through the book, um, it's the same thing we've said in the Morphew case as a sort of prelude to it. It's Juan Martinez's words, the prosecutor in the um, Jody Arias case, um, where he said, you know, in his experience, um, serious crimes, you know, um, murder, um, serious crimes, the motive is either sex or, or money or a combination of that. Now, consider that in the Van Gogh story, is money a factor? Was sex a factor? Were, were both of them a factor? Now, you might think about it from kind of a perspective of Dr. Gachet, money, yes, money was a factor. But you could also think about it from Van Gogh's perspective to say he didn't have much money, but his brother was in a precarious financial situation. And in that sense, he kind of relied on benefactors and clients and patrons like Dr. Gachet. He needed well-to-do folks to buy art. And, and Van Gogh, as an artist who didn't sell any art, knew that his brother relied on and was dependent on uh, sort of wealthy clients. So he would have wanted to protect um, someone like that in, in terms of his, for his brother's sake, right? And it does put into perspective him saying the sadness is going to last forever because you kind of get, I, I, my, my impression of what that means is he didn't actually cut off his own ear. He didn't commit suicide, but he took these burdens upon himself while on this incredible journey to try and sell paintings. And I've been through that myself. Uh, Bridget Bowman, welcome to the Transit Lounge. I know I did invite you in a previous chat. Thank you for taking me up on that offer. Um, Nisi says, also says hello, everyone. So um, where was I? Um, damn, uh, totally lost my train of thought. Oh, the sentence is going to last forever. So... I've been there myself where um, you you sort of work, you get a little bit of, um, uh, you make some inroads, but it's not enough. You're not, you're not really, you're not making a breakthrough. So you do more and more. You're still not making a breakthrough and people still don't recognize you. And so you work more and more and more and you still don't get credibility. And so you work more and more and more. You're still not getting that sense of acknowledgement. So you work more and more and more. And, you know, I eventually wrote over a hundred books, um, probably, I don't wanna say thousand blogs, but, but possibly uh, hundreds of blogs every single day um, and on and on and on. But all I'm trying to say is you try and overcome the entropy, you try and overcome that resistance, you try and overcome that doubt, that uh, all of that stuff by sheer effort, by sheer work ethic, and you still fail. You know, you still, all of that work still nevertheless gets sort of scattered um, in an, on rocky soil kind of thing. And then obviously Van Gogh dies and then his work becomes some of the most celebrated work, artwork in the world, some of the most expensive art in the world after he's died. But in terms of him, the sadness does last forever because he doesn't succeed in his enterprise. He doesn't succeed in terms of his life, his own efforts. It, it, it's ultimately a failure. You could say he succeeds by virtue of his art, but that's not... That's not really what he wanted. He wanted to be acknowledged in his lifetime, right? I think he was painfully aware of being acknowledged of what happens to artists is that you acknowledge your work becomes a lot more valuable 
but as a writer myself, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of say it's okay if my work gets celebrated um, fifty years from now or hundred years from now. It's okay with me. Now I would say, while I'm alive, can you can you give me a bit of credit, right? If something happens after I'm gone, great. But uh, to be honest, I don't really care about it that much. It would be nice, but what I care more about is now making that breakthrough now. And that's what I think he meant by the sadness will last forever. Despite all his travails, he actually overcame them, worked, got back to work, worked like hell in those last 70 days, and then ultimately it was it was sort of derailed anyway. And then that was the situation that he was left with, trying to protect his brother and um, also kind of being abandoned in... Almost the same way that I think Paul Gorgar abandoned him at, at his weakest moment. Whether whether you agree that he cut off his own ear or that they had an argument, Paul Gorgar nevertheless abandons his friend where he's almost bled to death. Now you have the same thing. He's bleeding to death. He's on his deathbed. And where is Dr. Gachet? Dr. Gachet says he was, he was full of hope and he was trying to save him. He was offering to save him. That's his story. But the other story is that, that he said nothing to him, that he did nothing, that he wasn't around. Um, and then there's this creepy aftermath. So from Van Gogh's perspective, you know, he wasn't, the doctor wasn't even there when Van Gogh died, when he breathed his last. Some friend, right? So from Van Gogh's perspective, you can understand that feeling of the sadness will last forever. This this. Think about what he's trying to convey through the energy, the life energy he was depicting in his paintings. And to some extent, he was a sick man. He was, he had syphilis. Uh, his brother was, was six months away from death uh, himself. His other brother was also going to die some years later. Um, but he was, he was, he was um, inspired by the invigorating pulse of life. It was inspired by the electricity of the world, of color, of the sort of vib vibrating vibrancy in nature. And um, he saw that, and that's something that still echoes through time. 130 years later, we see that. We see this, this um, pulsating sun and shimmering fields of wheat and all that kind of thing, right? And so what he saw, that expressive um, expressionism um, lives with us today, right? SM Kowalinski says, yes, tragic. Actually says, like a vulture. Nisi says, abandonment by those he trusted, just so sad. Um, Paddy says, this series and group bring me joy. Stephanie says to become more known because of his sad, untimely story. One thing that I think he would feel quite good about is the fact that his letters survived, that his words did survive, that, that some people at least got a sense of who he was. So after this series, we, we may do a follow-up, um, not soon, but on the Van Gogh letters. Um, so that's something that's sort of coming up. Um, this this series has been a labor of love. I've it's cost me quite a lot of followers. Every time I put a video up, it's like minus ten, minus twenty followers. It's like I didn't sign up for this. I'm not not signing up for art classes. I'm interested in the Chris Watts case. I'm interested in Alec Baldwin. I'm interested in that. What's what's this Van Gogh nonsense? So it's been quite expensive for me in that sense. But it's also been a labor of love and it's been something I've wanted to do kind of as a way of, um, almost as a way of dealing with my own injury. Um, although it predated that, um, um, I could have actually cut it short if I wanted to. So I'm in a way glad that I did it, but I'm also kind of glad that I'm going to be done with it. I do want to sort of move on to, to, some, to something else in a way. Not that I won't come back to it, but... Um, I also want my channel to go back to the way it was growing. Um, so I hope you guys can understand that. 
Um, future episodes may be members, totally members only in terms of where if you uh, subscribe, you can't actually watch it. In other words, um, not like chat where you can watch it, but but you can only participate in chat. Um, where you can't actually watch it, you've got to be a member. Um, I sort of feel like this is really good content actually, but people kind of have some kind of, you know, there's almost like a mismatch between those interested in true crime and those interested in in art in a way. Um, I don't know whether some people think it's too arty-farty or too sophisticated or too out there or too conspiracy theory or what, but um, there's definitely a strong true crime element to to this, and that's the area we're going to go into now. So it's, it's going to be quite exciting. So we 20 minutes in there, about 40 people watching, which is kind of a um, university class. So I think we need to get started. Timmy, you need to just go, or go off to somewhere else. Timmy, come on. Okay, I'll just sort of let him down that way. So we're on page 166. Stephanie, I don't know if you're following in your in your book. We're reading from uh, Van Gogh's finale from Martin Bailey. Um, and we're going to be going through eight pages. And I think this is pretty much the last analysis that we're going to look at for now. Uh, there are other chapters. Um, there are other chapters worth looking at, such as the chapter dealing with fakes. Uh, there's a chapter. There's a chapter dealing with fakes. It's called Fake Question Mark. So, I mean, that is a part of the Van Gogh story, the, the sheer amount of fakes associated with his work. Um, and, and that chapter, fake, question mark, runs directly after the father and son chapter on Dr. Gachet and his son. So... So we're going to kick off on page 166, and as you can see, it's just full of highlights, right? And um, I appreciate that, Stephanie. Stephanie says the few that are. The few that do understand the meaning and value of Van Gogh of the Van Gogh series are practicing true crime rocket science. I, I personally think that this is some of my best work. I mean, it can, could potentially change art history. In fact, I did reach out to CNN, and for a while they were going to do something. Um, I'm not going to say the reporter that I spoke to, but she's she's quite often on CNN daily. In fact. And we were going to do something on this, and then um, I'm not sure if it was Brexit or something, but that then changed the plan. So it was like, um, huge breakthrough about to happen. You're going to be on CNN, amazing, uh, nothing, right? So so anyway, um, uh, on page 166, however, it seems unlikely that Theo gave Dr. Gachet all the works. So we, what's being discussed now is this idea of did, how did Dr. Geshe get 26 of Van Gogh's paintings? So we know that he pilfered basically, that he kind of instructed his son to quickly gather up a lot of his art uh, at the funeral. You know, it, it's literally, um, it's almost like collecting a ransom. It, it's literally like transactional. This guy's died. Now, it's almost like looting, you know, it's like looting a coffin, looting, um, you know, like what they did with the, with, the, with the pyramids and the pharaohs. You loot these graves, you know, it's like this incredible uh, historical archive and then, and it, you know, with, with, um, with, a, with the pharaohs inside. And, you know, it's, it's a sort of once in a lifetime moment where everything is preserved and then someone goes in there and they just 
you know, break things and take things, and um, and then no one no one really knows what what the original setup was like. Um, it's like a bull in a china shop. Um, this is kind of the same. Um, Dr. Gachet takes a lot of these works, and then there's this idea of some of them are forged later on, some of them aren't, which r- really ruins, in a way, um, Van Gogh's legacy. Because you're not just looking at his art saying, oh, what a beautiful painting. You know, really, the, I really get the spirit of Van Gogh in this painting. Well, really, that's so beautiful. There's a part of you that's going, is this fake? Right? You're not, like, appreciating the art. Part of you is also, like, going, okay, that's quite nice, but is it fake? Which totally ruins it. It, it ruins the artistic experience when that's part of what you are thinking. You know, is this real? Is this even real and there's quite a lot of that in Van Gogh I must say there are quite a few uh, artworks that are considered real even by the Van Gogh Museum that are considered authentic that I just don't believe are quite a few of them um, where I'm like cheapest are you telling me that this is real and one came out fairly recently where a collector wanted 300 million dollars from the Van Gogh Museum for not um, saying something's authentic and it doesn't like an aerial view of Orvez and the museum argued sorry when Van Gogh painted this how how is he supposed to get this perspective in a hot air balloon or you know it just wouldn't have been possible so anyway the fake things are real uh, it's a real problem and where the story starts where the story about fake start are with the gachets, or let's put it this way, where the suspicion starts is with the gachets and kind of prototypically with the portraits of Dr. Gachet. So you've got this most expensive Van Gogh in the world and then you've got another one that looks just like it and then there's a dispute whether Van Gogh actually painted it. There's a dispute whether he actually gave it to Dr. Gachet. And that's a, it's not like a ha-ha-ha empty thing, it's a real thing. Uh, Nisi says, puts questions forever into his art. You should just be immersed into it, enjoy it thoroughly. Hey, Jealousy says, always document your work. Corporal Depp says, was there painting lost and found recently? What's well, happening all the time? It's happening all the time. Yvonne Phillips says, so cutting edge what you do, you are ahead of your time and yet you are an old soul. Great combo. Thanks for that, Yvonne. Okay, so so someone asked, I think in the previous live, you know, what, what was Joe's feeling about Dr. Gachet? And it's a great question. It's an interesting question. And yeah, Bailey provides the answer in her own words. Um, it says that Joe wrote an emotional condolence letter after Dr. Gachet died. He died at the age of 80. He died of a heart attack at home in Auvers in 1909, so 19 years after the fact. Um, his body was taken not to the cemetery in Auvers, but to the um, famous um, cemetery in Paris. I don't really want to attempt to... Um, pronounce this, but uh, it's something like Père Lachaise Cemetery. Um, and uh, anyway, at the time that he died, um, Joe, Theo's wife, at this time of widow, a widow of 19 years as well, uh, wrote the following. Never, never will we forget my son and myself what he did for the memory of Vincent. So she's saying... Um, her child, also named Vincent, Theo, Theo's child with her, me and, and, and baby Vincent, um, never will we forget what he did for the memory of Vincent. And in the previous episode, we spoke about uh, Van Gogh's remains being exhumed and all this kind of thing. And I think, I think my, inter- my um, interpretation of that is sort of twofold. On the one hand, I don't think I don't think Van Gogh would have become famous like at all um, 
if it wasn't actually for Dr. Gachet, um, whether you say it was uh, foul deeds, double dealing, or his actual clout in the art world, um, I don't really think that would have happened. It's possible that the letters would have done it, uh, but I just don't think so. The, Dr. Gachet did do a lot, you know, the whole exhuming of the grave, putting the brothers side by side, that was already going to improve his legacy. Um, um, and, and also Dr. Gachet being associated with the narrative, being at the funeral, would be giving Van Gogh the sudden credibility, you know, from a doctor, from this uh, patron of the arts, the sudden credibility. And um, also... Um, all of this was in the newspapers and then it did start gathering momentum slowly at first, but it certainly did gather momentum. Um, it, it is not as though Van Gogh's art suddenly a year later sold out in galleries the next year or the year after that or the year after that. That didn't really happen. It did uh, slowly start gathering momentum and Dr. Gachet had a role in that, which Joe... Um, mentions here, but what's really important is that his son took over that role in in shaping the narrative in um, wheelings and dealings in the art world that would have significant repercussions. Um, and so, so it's quite interesting, definitely quite interesting. Um, Lindsay... Meglin, welcome to the Transit Lounge. We've got another member here. Bridget Bowman says, it is some of your best work in my opinion and I do think it's likely to change the historic narrative of Vincent's death. The right ears need to hear you, that's all. <laughs> Stephanie says, I told my mom that I thought Gorgar cut off Van Gogh's ear and she laughed at me. Yeah, well, that can happen. If you give her some more context, the fact that Gorga asked for his weapons back, so he left all in such a hurry that he actually left his swords behind, um, that might change her mind a little bit. Um, and the fact that he went directly from all to witness an execution, we know this, this is a fact. He went from all to Paris, where he stood in the front row to watch an execution. Um, you kind of get this sort of bloody-mindedness from Gorgar. That Gorgar is also a bit of a um, kind of crazily aggressive fellow that, that um, you know. And then there's also the absinthe aspect to both of them, that both of them were going to brothels, both of them were partying up a storm, but disagreed, I guess, violently in terms of their attitudes to art and and, and so on. Vincent painted really, really quickly and with like, I think they call it, is it anti, anti not antipasto, um, um, what's it called? Um, Im, is it impasto? But um, these thick layers of paint and in plein air, whereas Gorgar would paint slowly uh, cerebral themes and, the, and very thin layers. Um, Stephanie says, I'm going to have her read your book on the fly to Vegas. Well, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting if your mother changes her mind on a few things. Um, you should also let her watch Loving Vincent because um, that may challenge just some of her general thoughts anyway. Something I came across that I wish I could quote for you here, but I, I'll... Um, I'll have to sort of see if I can find it. Impasto, that's it. Um, is where they say, somebody says, I don't, know, I don't know what the source is. I wish I could give you the source. But they say that Marguerite Gachet, um, you know, like this idea, was she in love? Was she in love with Vincent? Was she in love with this 37-year-old? Was she in love with this sort of um, socially awkward um, weirdo? Um and somebody said that they noticed that she changed. They noticed that 
you know, you know, like when someone's in love, they smile a lot and their behavior sort of changes in, in sort of a subtle way. They, their mood is lifted, their spirit changes. Someone said they noticed that about her. Um, I think I put the link, I put a lot of links in the beginning. It's one of those links. Um, but you could say that, you could argue that that is hearsay. But that may bring in that whole thing of, is this about money? Is it about sex? Is it about sex and money? Um, so on page 166, shortly under this this quote from a letter from Joe about we'll never for forget what he did for the memory of Vincent, um, Bailey writes, quote, Gache Jr. and his sister Marguerite continued to live in the Orvez house, in other words, in their father's house, in Dr. Gache's house. In 1911, Gache Jr. married Emmy. Emilienne Bazir, the former housekeeper of the doctor's friend Moureux. They had no children and the marriage does not appear to have greatly changed his way of life. But his sister never married. So there's your answer. Um, Paul Gachet did marry. Um, we don't know too much about em Emilienne, um, but what's quite interesting is his sister didn't marry. Why didn't his sister marry? So Paul Gachet gets married, his sister doesn't. Um, he, he writes here that, so the three of them live together in this house. Gachet Jr., his wife, and, and uh, Marguerite. And what, what's quite interesting is you kind of get a sort of a dysfunctional sense of it that, that, um, their father dies, they live in his house, and it's, it's not like Paul and his wife and, it's, and they have kids. Um, it's like Paul doesn't have kids and his wife doesn't get married, and so the three of them live in this weird reservoir of memory, right? And not only that, it's like, they, they don't actually work. They don't, they don't actually have jobs. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering whether I must disclose this information. Um, so my great-grandfather's a famous artist, um, and there's a d descendant from him who... Um, in fact, more than one, but uh, let me just say in very general terms, who there, there was basically this scenario of of not having money and then just selling an artwork and then you would have a certain amount of money and then when you need to, you sell another artwork. Now, from other family members' perspectives, you feel that this is not a really good scenario because you want to preserve the family heritage, right, of art, right? I'm talking about in, in my extended family, right? right? <laughs> so something like that was happening with the gachets where you kind of get the idea that they weren't working, but when they needed money, they would sell a, a painting, right? Um, uh, it, it's kind of um, interesting that... Although Dr. Gachet had these ambitions to become an artist, so did his son. His son had them perhaps even more. Um, and you can argue that it was even more of an obsession with his son because his son, it wasn't like his son had another job at least to fall back on. Um, so um, although I know one of them was, was, was Paul Van Rysel or used the Van Rysel name, and so Paul Gachet Jr. also used the Van Rysel name, but a different first name. Anyway, so so he went to a lot of effort, Paul Gachet Jr., also to try and break into the, to make it like a breakthrough as an artist, and of course he failed as well. The Gachets were crappy artists, right? But what does seem to emerge is there's this sort of, journey from being obsessed with this idea of I want to be an artist and making art 
and imitating art and collecting art and then the sort of impression that did you also create fakes, right? So it starts off with dad wants to become an artist. He invites artists into his home. He collects art, whatever. Then the son takes over that in, a, in many ways, takes over the care of Van Gogh's grave. Uh, but he, he now inherits the Van Gogh legacy in terms of all these, these art works. But, but then also, he's also painting. And bear in mind, all of this happens to him at a very young age. And so it takes over his whole life. And, and then so he goes on to to um, try and create his own artwork. He does, he paints quite a lot of artwork regarding Van Gogh himself. Like this is the place where Van Gogh died. He paints his father with his hand on um, a skull. I don't know if that's supposed to be Van Gogh's skull, but nevertheless. Um, uh, Susan Smith says Dr. Gachet was jealous of Vincent. Dr. Gachet and his son even used than in the art alias. It's quite interesting. Um, Stephanie says, Susan Smith, thank you. Uh, Susan Smith joined membership and is unable to chat. Anyone have any thoughts why? I don't know why. Put user in timeout, hide user, add moderator. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know why you can't chat. Um, not sure what the problem is. Yeah, so don't get confused between being a member on Patreon and YouTube. It's totally different. Okay, so... Um, Let's uh, let's get going here. At the bottom of page 166, um, Bailey writes about them leading a simple life in the Gachet home. Um, they never had a telephone, so it's quite a kind of eccentric family. The, um, it gets weird and weirder. Um, uh, Bailey writes that Paul Gachet Jr. dressed in his father's clothes. So, so it's kind of like he doesn't have a job. He's trying to become this artist. He even wears his father's clothes. In pictures of Paul Gachet Jr., that they kind of look like his, if his father he seems to have the same sort of beard. Um, so, so there's this weird father-son thing going on. Um, Dad, I'm going to finish what you started. Dad, I'm going to, I don't know, continue your legacy, whatever. And um, so he dressed in his father's clothes until the end of his own life, not just like for a phase as a young man, like throughout his whole life. Um, and it says here that he even wore the the coat that his father wore during the the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Now, I've made the case before that, you know, as a candidate for a murder suspect, you might say, but he was a doctor or, you know, that he was a rich guy or that whatever is a well-to-do fellow. But the fact is he was a military doctor. He'd been in a war. He'd seen death before. He'd probably fired at other soldiers before in his life. He'd, uh, he had... Um, he had guns in his home. Um, he had experience in that area, right? And so this coat that he wore during the this coat that he wore W O R E during the war uh, remains in the house, and he, and even his son wears that. So it's like totally taking on. The mantle of his dad, but it's not really very. It's not. It's not like really deserving. I mean, it's a little bit. It's like wearing a, um, I love New York T-shirt or, um, you know, you know those T-shirts that show you were somewhere. 
but then you weren't there. It's, it's a little bit like that, but he's doing that with his dad, right? Um, so Bailey then sort of provides some background that shows Paul Gachet, the son, did make some kind of attempt at a at a vocation, at a life of his own, um, but apparently didn't succeed at that. He says that um, Paul Gachet Jr. briefly studied agricultural engineering from 1895 to 98. So... So from like five years after Van Gogh's death for three years till 1898. So I guess agricultural engineering is kind of a fancy word for farming, right? Um, but although he studied that, he never worked and neither did his sister. So, so that's just a weird thing is that not only did Marguerite not uh, get married, not have children, she didn't work either. It's kind of like Van Gogh comes into their lives and then she just sort of, it's just like th that defines the rest of her life. Is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to be at home in the garden and I'm going to look at the Van Gogh painting above my bed and, and then sort of stew in the memories and circumstances um, from then on. But one does wonder was there some sort of scenario, some sort of incident that traumatized her that she was responsible for or that she initiated or that she participated in that she felt bad about, guilty about, um, uncomfortable about or simply just had some sort of knowledge of? Did that knowledge um, implicate her brother? You know, or, or, you know, was it something that all three family members knew about and they sort of covered with one another? Um, it's an analogy for the um, scenario presented by some people in the John Bonnet Ramsey case that that several family members knew something happened, right? So either this happened or that happened and several family members knew about it. Could you have had that with the gachets? It's not just that Dr. Gachet shot Vincent. It could have been that his son shot Vincent and the daughter um, felt bad about it and the father was just sort of picking up the pieces kind of thing, right? Um, there they, quite a few scenarios. You know, like in the John Bonnet Ramsey case, there's theories like, did John do it? Did Patsy do it? Did Burke do it? You know, all of those. And, and then, um, and others. And so in this one, did the father do it? Did the son do it? Did the daughter do it kind of thing? Um, same kind of scenario. But the important thing to sort of deal with here is, are these people behaving suspiciously or are they just weird, right? It's kind of the same question that came up in the Amanda Knox case. Was her behavior suspicious or was it weird? And so... Is it suspicious to never get married? Well, I'm not married. Is it suspicious to never work? To me, that is the more suspicious part. The fact that Paul Gachet Jr. studies to work, but he never does work, that to me is quite suspicious. And that brings into it this money element, right? Um, because you've got to make money somehow. Um, also that his sister doesn't work. So although they're not working, they are doing something. You know, you can't say they are not working and so thus, I don't know, they're binge watching Netflix, right? They're, they're like literally doing nothing. They are doing something. The question is what are they doing, right? It's not work in the sense of I have a job with somebody, but it is some sort of effort is going into something question is what is that thing right um Yvonne says weird and suspicious SM Covalency says that could very well be interesting and alternative scenario so uh, Bailey goes on to say um their lifestyle was modest they inherited the house and what money they needed came from the occasional sale of an artwork and they are put a little kind of arrow it's like so they inherited the house. So they, they kind of inherited the sort of 
art history, this art legacy. They inherited the work of other artists, but especially Van Gogh. So just think of it like from this perspective of this youngish man and his youngish sister. Um, Their father dies. They don't have jobs, but what they do have are these sort of in, that is kind of part of the house is 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 the sort of assembled collected artworks that originally belonged to their father that now becomes theirs. They don't have jobs, but what they do have are these collected artworks. And then there's this history around some of that where one of these artists has painted their father, one of the artists, that same artist painted their sister. And this art, this particular artist, they they you know they had over for dinner and they had over for this and that. And this particular artist is starting to become more and more well known in different ways. I think um, Joe published the letters. I think in 1911. I'm not 100% sure about that, but she published his letters relatively early, and his legend was starting to gain traction in the public imagination. I'm talking about Vincent van Gogh's legend, his reputation in the run-up to the First World War. So so he was starting to catch on in Europe. And then the First World War basically just put put the pause button on all of that. Uh, I think the was the First World War um, 1918. Um, let me just check that. But basically, I th- if my if my memory serves, uh, her first book came out in 1911, Joe, on the letters, and so the First World War came out in 1914, ended in 1918. So basically, again, if my memory serves. Um, it had three years to gain momentum, so it had a few years to gain momentum in the public imagination, and then the war basically kind of um, dampened it all. And then the, kind of the same thing happened with the Second World War. Um, after the First World War, um, this interest in Van Gogh came back a little bit, and then the Second World War pushed it to the background once again. And it was only after the Second World War, like, Um, five years after the Second World War, uh, ten years after the Second World War, that Lust for Life came out and that book and that film. So both world wars basically held back the tsunami that was going to become the old Van Gogh thing. But also in that time, in that long extended period of time, there was time to uh, potentially develop fakes and to develop, um, come up with the story from other people. So anyway, it says here that um, although the Van Goghs, sorry, along with the Van Goghs, the Gachets owned nearly 50 paintings by Cezanne and Pissarro, as well as numerous other works. And so the thing that's quite interesting, and I think I put a link early on, is that there are a lot of, there are, there are a number of fakes uh, assumed to belong to the Gachets or associated with the Gachets, not just with Van Gogh, but with other artists as well. So it's not like it's only Van Gogh that the Gachets may have faked or that there's some questions about. It's also other artists like Cezanne, right? And guess who wrote an article about that? Martin Bailey. So Martin Bailey accepts and admits that that the Gesh, there's some sort of um, questions regarding the authenticity of artworks owned by the Gachets, but particularly in the sort of aftermath of Dr. Gachet, the original Dr. Gachet's death. And one does wonder if Paul Gachet Jr. was like a fraudster. Where did he learn... Where, where, where did that dishonesty come from? Where did that trickery, tricksiness come from? Where did that psychology of being dodgy come from? Um, remember Van Gogh said, the doctor's sicker than I am, also he said he's not to be trusted. Where, where's all of this coming from? And 
Um, I don't know if I agree with it, but somebody did um, like a snarky assessment of Dr. Gesha. I think it's on WordPress somewhere. And they, they showed how this doctor was, uh, a lot of people described him as a, as a talented artist and a mediocre doctor. I would describe him as a crappy um, artist and an absolutely sucky doctor. Um, he absolutely failed in his treatment of uh, Vincent van Gogh, but anyway, in this particular um, assessment of Dr. Gachet, on, so on WordPress, the guy describes Dr. Gachet as a homeopathic doctor, and a lot of people agree that that is what he was. He wasn't really a real doctor, although the fact that he sort of performed autopsies does seem to show that he had some skill in, in some ways as a doctor, kind of as a doctor of death in a way. But um, uh, there's a photo of Dr. Gachet's medical kit, and he would sell these sort of, um, what do you call it, homeopathic remedies, and it would be made up of um, certain herbs from his garden. And somebody said, anyone, what, what did he say? Snake oil salesman, question mark. So what he's suggesting was that Dr. Gesher was actually kind of like a con artist, that he was selling, literally selling these remedies um, you could either say that he knew didn't work or that he believed did work, but nevertheless, that was what he was doing. Is there a difference between selling bogus medicine and selling bogus art? Just something to consider. So, interesting comment, Stephanie. So, um, so this is the part where, you know, we, we said, uh, are crimes committed because of money or sex or combination? Uh, Bailey writes, at to, this is incredible. At today's prices, Dr. Gachet's collection would be worth at least a billion pounds, not dollars, pounds. That is a SHIT load of money, right? A billion pounds is a lot of money. Just think about it, 50 paintings by Cezanne and Pissarro and 26 Van Goghs. It's a heck of a lot of money. It's a heck of a lot. And the um, so on the one hand, you, you know this. You know that this art collection that they've got is like this absolute treasure trove, like in art history. It's like this, um, you know... Just, I'm just trying to think of like, um, anyway, it's, it's, it's just this ridiculously um, bountiful collection of, of art, right? And, um, and yet, even though that's the case, you've got the, the son wearing his dad's clothing, but doesn't seem to have a job, and, and they sort of lead this moderate lifestyle. And then you have this scenario and again, I'm quoting from Bailey, after talking about it being worth at least a billion pounds, not million, billion, he says, quote, villagers periodically spotted Gachet, junior, meaning Dr. Gachet's son, setting off for Paris with a package on his way to see one of the dealers. So he didn't have a job, but what you would see every now and then was the, the son would sort of um, you know, get dressed up and he would have a package under his arm and he would go off to Paris. What do you think he was doing? Well, he had a painting to sell, right? He had a painting from a, a very respected artist that belonged to them and he's now going to take it to an art dealer in Paris and he's going to sell it and now they would have, um, you know, a lot of money that would tie them over for the next few weeks, months, and maybe even longer, right? So um, then that was how he was really making a living, would be every now and then he would wrap up uh, artwork and he would head to Paris and voila, um, uh, thanks a lot for the money. 
and there's potential intertextuality <laughs> to this in Alec Baldwin. You know, he's dealing with this show called uh, is is it called Art Fraud? Dealing with the um, gallery, is it in New York uh, that that brought out these f- uh, f- uh, fake um, modern artworks? Um, you know, I don't know how many paintings, but it amounted to um, millions and millions of dollars, right? But it was the same ruse, the same thing of sell one, sell another one, sell another one, and each time you're making crap loads of money, right? So Bailey writes, when he traveled across Paris, a priceless painting under his arm, he took the metro. And in, in, in other words, you must kind of picture this strange dude. He um, isn't go to Paris in a car, isn't go like in a limo. He doesn't I suppose you wouldn't go by boat, but he goes there in a, in, in fairly in a fairly modest transport. He, he, he kind of goes the way ordinary folks do. So although he's traveling with this incredibly like priceless art, he is sort of going like the common man kind of thing. You know, you wouldn't think the thing he's got under his arm is this, you know, really um, priceless work of art. Um, which I, which may or may not say something about whether it really was prices, because if it really was prices, wouldn't you sort of want security? Wouldn't you want to sort of um, drive there, drive there rather? You know, wouldn't you would you want to get there in a private capacity? You know, um, just something to, to consider. So in other words, isn't he revealing through that that he doesn't think it's so valuable? Because what are the chances of having something like that snatched from under your arm in a very public space like the metro? You know, like you on, on, a, on the train itself, you're at very close quarters with other people. And when you get up off, you know, onto the platform at the train station, you're also at very close quarters, right? Um, would you carry a, a uh, would you carry a suitcase filled with a million dollars? Would you like take it onto like um, you know like like a what do you call it um, the tube in you know would you take it on ma- mass public transport? Like would you go to the bank, get a suitcase filled with a million dollars, and then and then sort of go on public transport, or would you want to sort of try and uh, be in a sort of space where you've got control of your environment kind of thing. Susan Becker said, did anyone die from his remedies? Um, Susan, one way to address that question is just that he you can actually see him uh, with his hand on the digitalis, which is foxglove, and, and the foxglove is poisonous. Everything is poisonous. The the roots, the stem, the leaves, the flowers, the seeds, everything. And so, and and it's not just him, a lot of doctors at that time, or the medical profession at that time seemed to see foxglove as a sort of medicinal plant. Almost like if you're excited, you know, if you got excitability, if you if you got if you sort of have this nervous energy or anxiety then taking foxglove, well, because it's poisoning you, it is going to subdue you. Do you know what I mean? In other words, something that is going to undermine your undermine you because it's poisoning you is also going to slow you down. And so the impression from someone who doesn't know any better is that I've actually managed to cure your nervousness, your excitability. But it was actually poisonous and was used for quite a long time for quite a few different remedies. Um, Foxglove's not unique in that. In the history of medicine, they used a lot of poisons for a long time without knowing that they were poisonous. Um, poor, poor folks who had the bad luck to be around at that time. My grandfather... Um, it's a little bit different, but he actually died of a not a he didn't do this on purpose, but he died of a um, 
overdose of a new new wish medicine um what is it um i think it's cortisone um cortisol or cortisone um was fairly new at the time they didn't know what was the right dose and so the amount that he took was toxic he was in a lot of pain and he was taking it for pain and took too much and so that those those were the sort of formative steps of the medical profession um So at the bottom of page 166, Bailey writes that Paul, Paul Gachet sold off the Van Gogh paintings gradually from around 1912 up until 1950. And there I've written the word yes in like a very big yes and an arrow pointing to that. And the reason I've done that is to show you that um, – First of all, he sells the first one in 1912. I don't know if my timeline is right, but I think that Joe published the first book of letters in 1911. So around this time, his publicity, his reputation is growing. And so in step with his reputation, so they're going to want to enhance his reputation because enhancing his reputation is going to enhance the the value of their art so they have a stake in his story right um paul gachet jr has a made as probably the biggest stake of anyone in telling the van gogh story in a way that's going to make him look good but also make him the most money bear in mind again he doesn't have a job so he wants to make the mo he wants to make um, make hay while the sun shines kind of thing. He wants to make the most of what he has. He wants to leverage his um, uh, the artworks that he has. The other thing that I think is quite interesting is um, the timeline here, 1912 until 1950 is almost 40 years. So for 40 years, um, Paul Gachet systematically, slowly, carefully, meticulously, strategically releases Van Gogh artworks into the art world. And he's an artist himself, and he is using art as a direct means of making money. And um, there's questions, are some of these fake or not? There's also the issue of did Van Gogh really paint 70 paintings in 70 days, right? Did Van Gogh really paint that many paintings in 70 days? Um, on the one hand, it sounds like quite a good story. On the other hand, maybe painted 40. And so maybe painted a painting every second day. Nevertheless, still a, a, a very productive artist. But the idea that he painted 70 paintings in 70 days brings up the suspicion as well that aren't some of those 70 paintings fake? Didn't someone else paint some of those 70 paintings? Just a question. Unfortunately. Um, then right under that, I don't know if you're following Stephanie on page 167, and it's next to a picture of Dr. Gachet um, sitting down in his salon, um, Dr. Gachet, Paul, sorry, not Dr. Gachet, Paul Gachet Jr. in his salon from 1935. Anyway, it says, while in his early 20s, early 20s, uh, Paul Gachet Jr. set out to become an artist. So he started off actually wanting to become a farmer, studying to become a farmer, and then something changed his mind. Something changed his mind. And so they say he did lots of things and blah, 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 blah. And then halfway through this page, Gachet Jr. turned to art history and he compiled a detailed catalog of the major artists in his father's collection. So he's now starting to become quite a 
art guru from becoming kind of a farmer dude he becomes this sort of you could say a narrator but he also kind of becomes a art um, participant I guess he starts keeping a, a log of what's going on but he's starting to it's almost like you convert um, you convert works of art into balance sheets into into sort of logs and tables into into words into into something else right you you to put it in a symbolic sense you spin straw into gold right so you you have these works of art and you now start the process of the accounting the um, you know when was this painted what size is it um, and, and and so in a, in a way he, he starts to sort of document all of this stuff um, on the one hand it's good because you've got this record but on the other hand is the is this documentation accurate or is it like you know accountants manipulating the balance sheet is it is it is what you're seeing there you know it's like the way if you sign an artist's name on a on a on a fake painting um that doesn't mean it's now a genuine painting in the same way if you write down um uh you have a Cezanne from um 18 1880 or whatever although you've written it down doesn't mean that that's real it just means it's written down anyway that's what he is busily doing so he doesn't have a job but he kind of employs himself as the sort of art historian and uh, it says here that he remained an amateur even though he like took on this really real mission to become an artist and to trading art and all that he remained an amateur himself never forging his own particular style so so whatever whatever is going on here ultimately like his father he never really graduates as an artist he never really makes it he, he's a failure as an artist but so what do you do with that right um if you which and you kind of have the same thing with Van Gogh as well. He's ultimately a failure as an artist. What do you do with that? And so with, in, with Van Gogh, he simply persisted. He simply remained determined. He simply continued, right? Um, oh, crap. I think my dog needs, the, needs to go to the bathroom. He's jumping up against the door downstairs. Um, To me, come here. I don't know if he's playing with a cat, but I actually think he's... I think I'm going to have to be excused. Um, okay, give me a moment. I'll be back. To me, come. Oh, sorry about that. By the way, here's Ivy just saying a quick hello and goodbye. She wants to go out as well. 
<sighs> Sorry about that. Um, th uh, there's just no way I'm going to sit through another hour while my dog needs to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so sorry about that. I've left the door open. <coughs> so the cat and the dog can sort of come and go as they please. Yeah, Timmy's uh, actually got a bit of a upset stomach, so he's really eaten not very much. And uh, he seems to be drinking a lot more, which means he needs toilet breaks, like in the middle of a live. Susan Smith, thanks very much. The Gachets were obsessed with Vincent van Gogh's work. That's true. Okay, anyway, sorry about that break. So where were we? So we are at uh, an hour and 15 minutes. We, we're still stuck on page 166 and 67. I'm going to try and pick up the pace here because we've got another six pages to go through. So um, uh, it says here that he turned to art history. He compiled a detailed catalog. Uh, by 1928, he still wasn't done. So there were like books with books dealing with like books of um, with with um, diff of, of the different artists. Um, it says produced as typescripts for his own personal use. They remain unpublished. So it's quite interesting. He didn't he didn't really do this for public consumption. He did this for himself. So he's kind of keeping a record of of the art that they had and and so on. And then, and then I've highlighted this next part and put a big black sort of arrow right next to it, right? So it's just the section here. There you can see that's Paul Gachet over there, Junior. And so it says, quote, until the late 1940s, the family collection was shrouded in mystery. Now, remember what I said at the beginning, I said, is there anything suspicious? It's a, the thing you do in true crime generally. You've identified a suspect, yes. Is there anything suspicious about your suspect? Yes, okay. Um, and does it lead you to the level of dishonesty? So it might be suspicious, it might be he didn't have children, his sister didn't get married, okay. Is, that's not really suspicious. Does it lead you to a level of dishonesty? He didn't have a job. Mm, that's not so good, uh, but maybe it's okay. Um, what was he doing as a job? Well, he was taking a package to Paris every now and then and selling it. Oh, okay. Is there anything wrong with that? Maybe, maybe not. It's sort of still not going anywhere. Now it starts going somewhere. So quoting from page 167, not my words, this is Bailey's words, this is sort of a neutral source in terms of that. Quote, until the late 1940s, the family collection was shrouded in mystery. Why is that? I mean, the whole point of art and selling art is that you publicize it, you market it, you use public relations, you are trying to get people's interest in it. So why on earth are you mysterious about it? Why are you mysterious about your art collection? Right? So that's not in dispute. So we're really talking about for 50 years, for 50 years, right? So Vincent van Gogh died in 1890, right? It says until the late 1940s, the family collection, that should be the Gachet's collection of art was shrouded in mystery. Why? Why, why, why is it so mysterious? Um, and this is the part that where your eyebrows should start sort of going really, really like stretching your face, right? Your eyebrows should really start going up. Gachet Jr. refused to allow his Van Goghs to be photographed and very few art historians were admitted to his house. And so there you should be saying, what the F is going on here? 
right? So you literally have Paul Gachet refusing, right? I refuse to allow you to take a photo of my Van Gogh collection, right? I will not allow you to do that. Specifically the Van Goghs, you will not be taking any photos. That's number one. And number two, very, very few, very few art historians are admitted to his house. So he doesn't really allow people into his house to actually see what's going on. What's that all about? So remember I said, I believe that the second portrait of Dr. Gachet is fake, right? A photo of the Van Gogh collection somewhere along the line would either confirm or, or prove that that's true or not true. In other words, where is this other portrait of Dr. Gachet? Are you still working on it? Why are there 10 practice efforts? What's going on here? Or, oh, there it is. Okay, that's cool. There it is hanging up um, above the fireplace. Um, and also, what's this deal with art historians? Um, wouldn't you want art historians? By the way, Van Gogh is uh, becoming quite a respected artist. I've got Van Goghs. Come and have a look at them, right? So it's the opposite of what you'd expect. And and me as a writer, I've, I mean, I'm um, I'm aware of my duty as a writer. You know, like if an artist. Um, you have to, at some point, accept the the drudgery. The it feels a bit insulting sometimes, you, but you've got to take on that responsibility. That it's not enough just to create your work. You've got to market it. It's not enough just to make something, to write something, to produce something. You've also got to go and pitch it, sell it, uh, promote it, right? That is unfortunately part of what the whole artistic process is about, the whole creative process is about. I don't like putting my reviews on Twitter or anywhere. Um, I, I just wish it would speak for itself and just sells itself and lives happily ever after. But the fact is, as an artist, as a, as a writer, you've got to promote your work. Um, uh, Sometimes it sells without that promotion, but it certainly sells better with that promotion, right? But the bottom line being, you want people to take an interest in your work. You want um, people to be talking about it. You want people to be writing about it. You want you want that kind of thing. So why on earth would the Gachets not want the Van Gogh stuff to be photographed? And why on earth would you not want art historians to come into your home and Look at it and talk about it, right? It doesn't make any sense. Now we are going into that area that this is starting to look suspicious. This is starting to look like I'm hiding something away. Am I, am I hiding something away because I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing, right? He goes on to say, this is Bailey's words, he says, Quote, among villagers, he was regarded as a highly secretive, as highly secretive, and known as the hermit of Auvers. So now you've really got a um, really strong sense of this person who is behaving in a very bizarre way. Um, what is it? What, what has he got to be secretive about? Again, the the whole premise of art is that it's seen, you know, like you don't paint a painting and then, and then sort of um, put it in a cupboard. And then that's where it is. You, you paint a painting to, to have it seen, to have it up on a wall, to have as many people see it really as, as, as possible in a sense. Um, so what on earth is going on with this being secretive? And it's not like he's a little bit secretive. He's very secretive. He's not also not a little bit odd. He's very odd. He's also spending a heck of a lot of time um, sort of guarding, protecting, tending to Vincent van Gogh's grave. What's that about? So he's secretive, but then he also does 
things that are, are quite weird in that sense. He's secretive, but then he also interjects himself into the Van Gogh narrative. That's also kind of a mismatch. I don't have anything to say. Um, art historians, you can say whatever you like. Oh, are you talking about Van Gogh? I do have this to say. I do have that to say. What's that all about? When you see these sort of psychological mismatches between behavior and reasonable behavior, the behavior of your suspect and just reasonable behavior, you need to start paying attention. And so it also says here, so, so he's, he's regarded by his own community as a hermit, as the hermit of Orvez, as like the most secretive dude in Orvez. So there's a reputation around the gachets. Would you say it's a good reputation? Um, and then it says he, his gate was kept locked, right? That's that's like also no one's going to come in here without me knowing about it. Um, you know, no trespassing. Uh, I don't want anyone coming here while I'm copying this painting. I need to copy this painting in peace. And... That's why I've used this particular image of him standing by the gate here. There he's standing by the gate. That, that's him. Um, and if you see behind him, there's like a stairway. Uh, this is the bottom of the stairs by the, by the road. And then there's a stairway going up uh, to the house. And um, that remains like that today. And actually, I think they are... Plaques with artists' names as you go up the steps. They're plaques with artists' names. Um, so anyway, so he says, his gate was kept locked, and on the steps leading up to the house was the blunt notice, no callers. So he's basically saying, keep out, stay out, blah, 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 blah. Right? Um I'm not going to, I'm not even going to take visitors, right? Just everybody just stay out. Now, does that start giving you a sense of something secretive that's going on? Yes. And is it possibly secretive to the point that it's dishonest? Question mark. So, Nisi says paranoid obsessive guilt. I'm not going to say what Yvonne says, but uh, it's quite interesting. Corporal Deb says he hid in the villa. Paddy says the least he could do was tend to the grave of his benefactor, Van Gogh. Stephanie says, well, well put as well. Stephanie says all these suspicious actions are painting a picture. Uh, Bridget Bowman says, I believe the second portrait of Dr. Gachet is fake also. If you take that just by itself, if you just take that, and you say the second portrait of Dr. Gachet is fake. And you can see why the son of Dr. Gachet would be particularly interested in having the second portrait because it's his own father. He sees himself in a weird way as continuing his father's legacy. That's the best way to do it. Then just in that small little frame of a second disputed portrait of Dr. Gachet, and where does it come from? It comes from, um, you know, Dr. Gachet's home, which is now inherited by Paul Gachet. It kind of becomes like, eh, this really isn't looking good at all. And I can tell you, when I went to Orvez, now bear in mind, I'd already written the book. I already had my opinion, um, the sort of true crime-based um, opinion of, of what had happened. And, and then I go up to Dr. Gachet's house in Orvez. Here I am walking along. I've already written a book about it. I come up in the road to his house and I look and there is a um, kind of a tourist board showing that this is the home of Dr. Gachet. And guess which painting is out there? And I, and I couldn't help laughing. Um, it's like it's the second portrait of Dr. Gachet. And, and, and you can imagine Paul Gachet Jr. saying, yes, that's the portrait that we want there, or the Gachet family saying, yes, that's the portrait that we want there, because that's the portrait associated 
more closely with them. The other portrait, the real portrait, the authentic portrait was given to Theo. So we want the, and think about it, the original portrait is the most expensive and valuable Van Gogh ever sold. So it doesn't make sense to have a knockoff and then that's the best way you're going to make the most money out of it. Doesn't it make sense to do that? If you were in the, in the business of fakeries and forgeries and the most expensive picture, I'm not saying it was then, but um, the picture that is getting the most attention and interest and whatever is a particular picture, well, then the best one to kind of make knockoffs of or something similar is a picture like that. Does it, doesn't that make sense? Anyway, um so now Bailey, I think he's sort of rationalizing it a little bit. He sort of explains what this is all about. I think it's quite suspicious, but Bailey may not. So Bailey says, quote, Gachet Jr.'s privacy was partly for security. Okay, so that does kind of make sense. He's not doing anything secretive. He's not doing anything wrong. He's um, protecting this really expensive art that's behind uh, the gate, right? It doesn't quite make sense because why would you be secretive? And it, you, you could argue because you do have art that's worth a billion pounds um, today. You could argue that, but like I said earlier, um, when Paul Gachet takes his art into Paris, he takes the metro. Where's the security consciousness there? Is it really about security or is it about privacy? Is it really about um, uh, concealment? Um, uh, is it really about is it about security, legitimate security, or is it about illegitimate security? Bridget Bowman says shady. So anyway, it goes on to say, he goes on to say, um, so Bailey says this is for security and he had a prices collection. Oh, and then this is the part that's also really interesting, that Gachet Jr. Um, kept a revolver on his bedside table at night. That's how sort of, I don't know, paranoid he was about protecting this legacy of art, Right. I also find it just interesting that you've got the scenario of this kid who grows up to be this dude who keeps a gun next to his bed, right? And then you ask the question, did his father shoot Vincent van Gogh, who kind of uh, had a episode in his home, or did he himself shoot Vincent van Gogh? Or did his sister even shoot Vincent van Gogh? But yeah, you have another um, kind of reinforcement of guns in the Gachet home, right? And also Paul Gachet being familiar with guns and uh, being, being sort of like, um, I want a gun near me kind of thing. What's that all about? Is that normal? Um, anyway, so he goes on to say... Um, Ba this is Bailey sort of rationalizing this behavior. He says, quote, but more importantly, secrecy was deeply ingrained in his character. He was an extremely private person. <laughs> so this is just, I don't know, I'm sorry for laughing, but so, so I'm just going to read this quote. Um, see if you feel the same way about it that I do. But more importantly, secrecy was deeply ingrained in his character, meaning Paul Gachet Jr.'s character, and he was an extremely private person. There was one notable exception. He became fascinated with Japan and eventually welcomed hundreds of Japanese artists and art lovers who flocked to see his Van Goghs. <laughs> That's just absolutely ridiculous. So, so whoa, wow, so he is an extremely private person. He's doing this because he's very, very private, right? 
but then he welcomes hundreds of like tourists into his home and shows them the Van Gogh. I don't want art historians to see this. Don't take photos of this, but Japanese tourists, that is absolutely cool. You guys come along, right? And I think what this is giving away is that what he really does want is the anonymous masses to pick up, to take up this fascination, this, this um, what do you call it, uh, to, to, to be caught up in this art frenzy, right? So he wants the public to be caught up in this art frenzy, but, but he doesn't want it to be interrogated by people who know art, like art experts. He doesn't want art historians in there. He doesn't want the press photographing it. He wants sort of people who are laymen and sort of tourists and sort of the public. It's okay if it catches on with them because they, they don't really know um, the details. They can't interrogate what's going on. So that's fine. So how on earth can you say this is a really private person, that's his character, he's a private person, he's secretive, when he invites kind of anonymous tourists to storm into his house and, you know, like um, the doors are open, let the let them in. And, and, and you can just imagine this, this sort of stampede of um, Japanese artists and it's absolutely fine. And, it, you know, if you want to make the argument, you say um, – uh, Paul Gachet Jr., you know, his character, I'm sorry to be so sarcastic, but it's just, to me, it's just, it is kind of warranted. His character is that he's this private guy, but meanwhile, in the backstory to to um, to all of this, Dr. Gachet invites Vincent van Gogh into their home, who's a complete stranger at that point. Then they invite Vincent van Gogh's family to have like lunch or brunch there. Um, you know, Joe and um, uh, Theo and the little baby. And then they also invite Vincent over for like their birthday party, their birthday party, the birthday party of um, Paul and Marguerite. Um, Plus their father is engaging with all these other artists, not just Van Gogh, he's engaging with all these other artists. So where's this thing of that his character is that this private dude? Um, prior to Van Gogh's death, there was all of this um, interaction with, with other artists. And as a doctor, you have patients and you're treating them and this and that. Exactly in the same way when Van Gogh was shot, his father must go to the you know go out of his home to someone else's home meet the innkeeper um, have all of these strange interactions when when you, when your father's a doctor just like if he's a priest you're not going to have a very private life you're going to have people calling you at all hours right and now apparently his son is super secretive because that's his character really I think something happened at the end of July 1890 that made both Paul and his sister pretty secretive. Don't you? Stephanie says, so weird. Susan says, I think you nailed it. <laughs> Patty says, as mentioned, you could not make this stuff up. Bridget says, there's a reason for him being so secretive and hermit-like for sure. And as you say, complete psychological mismatch when it comes to Vincent's story, it's very shady and suspicious. So if we just go to this poll, um, I see 63 of you have voted. Thanks a lot for that. Um, almost 80% are saying murder, fakes, and a cover-up, which is sort of the worst one. Um, and then it goes all the way down to um, 13% for just maybe fraud and fakes, not murder. And then 10% say maybe there's a little suspicion. I think those who've said maybe there's a little suspicion would by now change that to more than a little. And there's, there's absolutely no one, say, no one who's voting saying um, that it's not warranted, that the suspicion is not warranted. Everyone's saying there is reason to be suspicious. So... Um, 
so I don't know. I, I, I read this and I just find it like, do, do you realize what you just said? <laughs> you know, his character is secretive, but he invites um, hundreds of Japanese tourists, you know, go for it, guys. Check out, check out my art collection. Um, he, he literally writes here hundreds of Japanese uh, artists and art lovers, hundreds, not like once upon a time, one day invited five Japanese people or one day he allowed um, uh, 12 or a group to come in. He literally says, eventually welcomed hundreds of Japanese artists and art lovers, hundreds. They flocked to see his Van Gogh's. They flocked. It's like this horde of tourists stampeding through his house. And today that is exactly what it is as well. I went... I, I'm a South African. I went through Dr. Geshe's house as well. I was part of the flocks, right? Um, when I was there, there weren't a terribly large amount of people, uh, but there were certainly easily 10 or 20 people. And I was there sort of out of season. I was there in early May. And then he writes, perhaps the fact that they came from so far away meant that he never perceived them as a threat to his undisturbed life. I think that that is a very good point. I, I agree with that. I think that was a factor. Them coming from so far away, I think, means not that he didn't perceive them as a threat, but that they weren't a threat. Why weren't they a threat? Because I think you've got to address that question is, how could he have been threatened? And I think the answer is, People with no local knowledge could have figured out what was really going on, right? So locals could have figured out what's really going on. Um, locals familiar with art, when I say locals, I kind of literally mean just Europeans, people in Europe, um, familiar with art may have been able to figure out what is going on. Um, but I think the part that is important to emphasize here is that he he was perceiving a threat. And I don't think the threat is, I'm scared someone's going to steal this art. I think the threat is something else. Um, that this thing I'm doing, this um, subterfuge that I'm busy with is going to be revealed. Um you could, I suppose, make the argument that someone coming from far away, um, knowing the contents of your home, also isn't going to really be a threat. I don't know if I buy that so much. Uh, in, in another way, you could argue the opposite, that someone from far away um, uh, could have even more reason, you know, like to take your stuff back home because it's a big deal there or something. Um, but to me, doesn't it speak to you more about this idea of, of subterfuge? And, um, but also at the same time, I want to be secretive, but I need the public to buy into this. So I need to keep this a secret, but I also need the public to be totally duped kind of thing. And that is often the weird dichotomy with art and especially, uh, art fraud is there's secrecy at the same time that things are like totally public there, there there's publicity and there is PR and there are exhibitions and things and at the same time there's sort of privacy and secrecy like who really owns this what's actually the story behind that and in a weird way you have that in true crime as well you'll have a suspect think about the Barry Morphew case on the one hand, there's secrecy and privacy and, to some extent, it's understandable. On the other hand, um, certain things go into the media and there are direct appeals by this person to the media, such as Barry Morphew's, um, uh, you know, where he talks on Facebook. Um, so there's like this weird balancing act between privacy and publicity. And you also got to ask, is this weird balancing act normal? Is it reasonable? Or is it something weird going on here? So, you know, another way of asking the question is you say, shouldn't you be, be, be public all the time? Shouldn't you be 
pushing this narrative all the time. So you could ask that about Barry Morphy. Shouldn't he have, if his wife's missing, shouldn't he have gone public again and again and again and again? And there might be a good reason not to do that. Maybe um, he's taken a lot of criticism and that might be a reasonable reason not to do that. But in terms of this art thing, you'd also say um, you've got these Van Goghs, you want to sell them, you are selling art, why wouldn't you want to publicize it? Why wouldn't you want to tell his story, show his story, um, get get these paintings into newspapers, invite reporters? Why wouldn't you want to do that? Why wouldn't you want locals also to come and have a look? Why wouldn't you want to spread the, the publicity, get the show on the road? Why would you not do that? And so Bailey refers to... Um, he's speculating, but he says it, he refers to Paul Gachet Jr. experiencing a threat of some kind. And I think that's true. There was a threat of some kind. Also, was there a threat to Van Gogh of some kind? Um, you know, he had syphilis. Did he like Marguerite? Was that a threat to her? Um, was he a threat to anybody? Did, did him being a threat to someone become them becoming a threat to him? Just quite interesting thinking about it. So now we're on page 168. It says here, I've highlighted here, Marguerite Gachet at the piano hung appropriately in the sitter's bedroom displayed in a white frame between two large Japanese prints. In 1934, the Gachets made the astonishing decision to sell this exceptionally personal painting to the Basel Kunstmuseum. For more than 40 years, it had never left the house, and there were dozens of other artworks they could have sold, right? Um, what I think is really interesting is if you accept, if you say Paul Gachet was up to no good, Paul Gachet was a crook, Paul Gachet was, um, you know, dishonest. If you say that, if you make that argument, then you kind of have this weird thing of, but he's living with his sister. What's going on there? Does she know about this? Does she, is she colluding with him? Is she helping him? Is she simply in the dark about it. Is, is, is she living there? Meanwhile, he is sort of doing his thing. Does, does he like lock the door um, of his study and she doesn't actually know what's going on in there? And so for me, it's quite hard to believe that she wouldn't know what he was doing. And if he was doing something wrong, that suggests that she in some way was either an accessory or um, went, was going along with it if one can put it that way. Bear in mind, she didn't have a job as well, so she also had a kind of an incentive to, to the scheme, whatever it was. So, you know, if you think about it, it's her painting, right? Uh, Marguerite Gachet at the piano is her painting. Van Gogh gave it to her. It doesn't belong to Paul. And yet Paul is kind of doing the art sales, not Marguerite. And so she then gives up this artwork in 1934. And it astonishes people because it's like, well, I thought you had this, this really personal, deep connection to Van Gogh. I, I thought you had this incredible, um, unique experience with this artist and now you're giving up like the most important thing that you still have. And, and you might say, no, 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 the most important thing was the portrait of Dr. Gachet, the second one. But I would argue this was the most important um, authentic piece um, from Van Gogh. This was the most important real painting that they had from him, right? And... And it's personal. She keeps it in her bedroom um, and and they keep it for 44 years and then they give it up.
Bailey emphasizes that for for, 40, for more than 40 years, this painting had actually never left the house. It's not like, um, although they had it at home, if there was an exhibition somewhere, they would give it to that museum. It was like they had it at home, it stayed at home, no one really saw it, except the hundreds of Japanese tourists, and then one day they just sold it, just like that, gone. Now, it could be that... Um, it could be that they wanted money or needed money. It could also have been that suddenly Van Gogh became very valuable and they wanted to ride that wave in a big way. I just want to go to the um, the footnote here because I think it gives the amount that they got, but I'm pretty sure they got a princely sum. Um just have a look here. Oh, by the way, I've just highlighted here um, footnote 45 um, in the chapter Father and Son um, on page 222, footnote 45, says, it was Mad Madame Liberge who claimed Van Gogh had shot himself in Rue Boucher. In other words, she must have overheard the shot in Rue Boucher, which is near the Van Gogh's home. So this is an identified source. It's not like somebody heard. It's actually an identified source. That's what I spoke about in the previous episode. And then it says here, despite overwhelming evidence that it was behind the chateau, guess where the overwhelming evidence came that it was behind the chateau, from the gachets? No surprise there. So anyway, um, I just want to deal... So here it says... Um, number footnote 42, the portrait of Marguerite Gachet was bought by the museum via the Eugene Blot Gallery in Paris for 315,000 French francs. So they obviously got a crap load of money for that particular portrait. And so You've got to ask the question, what's going on here? Are the gachets um, a deep, um, a deep, sensitive, um, intelligent group of people? You know, in other words, are they, how can I put it, are they... Um, yeah, you know, basically, are they shallow people or are they are they deep people? It's the same question I asked when we did the Barry Morphew thing. And it doesn't mean if you deep, you're not dishonest, or if you deep, you are dishonest. And it doesn't mean if you shallow, you are dishonest, or if you shallow, you are dishonest. Um, but if you are a, a shallow person it can mean that your relationships are shallow and sometimes you can be a shallow, shallowish or superficial person with quite good relationships. You, you don't sweat the small stuff or whatever, but you can also be a shallow person with shallow relationships. And as a result of that, your interest is more in things than in people and in money than in people. And so here you have a situation that it seems to show, Stephanie says that's about $340,000. So that's a huge amount of money. And so obviously in 1934, um, the Gachet suddenly realized Van Gogh is the big time. We can make we can make a killing, excuse the pun, with Van Gogh. And bear in mind, they continue selling his work for another 16 years in whatever way they do. But the selling of Marguerite Gachet at the piano, to me, shows that um, they are not that deep. Um, uh, you know, whatever their links to Van Gogh, whatever their relationship, ultimately it's trumped by um, um, material demands, material motives. Um, and I get the same idea with Dr. Gachet himself. Ultimately, he's more interested in death. 
uh, he's not really a great doctor um, and he's a, he seems a bit of a weird shady guy right he some people describe him as a snake's oil snake oil salesman in terms of his profession he's a guy who performs autopsies but he doesn't do x y and z and so on and so on um, so so anyway, so they, they sell this really important personal picture and it astonishes a lot of people. A lot of people are surprised. Wow, so you've been secretive about all this and it's worth so much to you, but then you dispose of it like that. What's that all about? Um, and then on page 168, Bailey writes, it may come as a surprise it has been suggested that Van Gogh and Marguerite had romantic feelings but were prevented from having an affair by Dr. Gachet. So, without, uh, without trying to hurt my rib, woohoo! There, uh, there you had this art expert in uh, Martin Bailey giving air, giving life to this story that... Um, could something have happened between Marguerite and Vincent? And this is mentioned only right here at the end on page 168. The book only goes to about 200 pages or so. So right here at the end, in the father and son chapter, Martin Bailey kind of acknowledges this idea that something could have happened between um, Vincent and Marguerite, and he does so in the context of her finally giving up this painting that he'd given to her, right? And you can kind of almost imagine that she may have had that painting and kept that painting with sort of feelings of guilt. So as a young girl, she may have had sort of irrational, unreasonable, weird, um, uh, romantic feelings towards the artist. Maybe she flirted with him a little bit. Maybe she was friendly with him, maybe, mis maybe misinterpreted it, maybe she just found him interesting. Maybe just because she paid attention to him, he misinterpreted it, right? Um, but the bottom line being probably Van Gogh was very much in love with her, very obsessed with her, very caught up with her, very head of the heels, where she may have been like mildly amused, entertained, interested. But then something happens, and for whatever reason, Van Gogh is shot, and it's kind of her fault, or she's kind of associated with it, and she's now got this painting. And so you can imagine her keeping the painting as a kind of a sign of, um, not attrition, what's it called? Um, uh, kind of like penance, kind of a acknowledgement uh, of what had happened. Um, no, I'm not saying she's guilty, just that there's this feeling of, um, of involvement, which she then lets go of. She then kind of goes, you know what, um, when she gets older, she then lets, lets go of that, of that feeling. Cause she was a young woman when this happened. And, um, in all likelihood, Van Gogh did probably kind of make a nuisance of himself, but she probably felt bad, whatever happened, uh, whatever her role was in this, um, you know, incident. Uh, I just want to look at what Stephanie wrote here. Madame Liberge was the local woman who was a childhood friend of Marguerite, really interesting. The same one who heard a gunshot in town. Uh, exclamation, exclamation. So, again, um, you, you might say, you know what, this guy Nick van der Leek from South Africa, you know, he thinks he calls himself a true crime rocket scientist. It's absolute nonsense. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And then you, you get all of these details, one after another coming through, which shift the story significantly in another direction, and it's anchored in evidence, not anchored in my opinion, it's not anchored in like you just got it out of the air. It's literally anchored in information. Whether that information is absolutely accurate, we don't know, 
but um, you can make the same argument that the story supporting the suicide narrative are based on similar sources, similar contemporary sources. Are they accurate? And what makes it even worse is from a true crime perspective, um, from a true crime perspective, it's, um, how can I put it? Uh, it's problematic when your suspect, your potential suspect is giving you a version of events. It's definitely potentially problematic. Okay, so thanks a lot for pointing that out, uh, Stephanie. Stephanie also says, um, Onisi says, change the landscape of it all. Paddy says, the devil is definitely in the details. Um, so, yeah, so he acknowledges here that it's been suggested that Van Gogh and Marguerite had romantic feelings. is definitely dramatized in um, Loving Vincent. I don't know what you thought about that, Stephanie, but it, it's really interesting the way that that she's confronted in the dramatization of loving Vincent Marguerite's confronted about her feelings about Vincent. She sort of says, yes, I did like him. Yes, we did hang out. Yes, he did paint my portrait. Yes, um, yes, 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 yes. But yes, all of this gossip from the, from the, from the town. No, we weren't having an affair. Um, and, um, Yes, I, I do take flowers to his grave every day, but that doesn't mean I'm, I just care about him the way you care about any any other person. And so that's quite interesting how it's uh, dramatized there, where she's got to defend, um, you know, um, rumors. She's got to kind of defend herself against that. Um, and it's quite interesting how they have this conversation in the wheat fields, in the fabric of the wheat field with crows, Image and and so what's almost being suggested there is the whole wheat fields with crows tension and um, the portent of that is related to the mysterious circumstances of Vincent Van Gogh and Marguerite and I, I think that rings so true I think that's done so well I think that that intuition um, is right on the nail it, it's just a, a great way of depicting that concept. So anyway, uh, he goes on to say the following. This is These are Bailey's words, right? Uh, talking about Marguerite having romantic feelings, but she was prevented from having an affair by Dr. Gachet. So if that's true, if Dr. Gachet was preventing the affair, Dr. Gachet... Think about the Barry Morphew case. It's this idea of, um, from the prosecution's perspective, it's this idea of his wife having an affair and and the husband trying to prevent something. And then does something happen to her? So in this Van Gogh scenario, is it something similar? Um, the daughter wants to have an affair or Van Gogh wants to have an affair with his daughter um, Dr. Gachet has read some of these CD books that Van Gogh's given him. Um, he's starting to get really triggered and alerted. He gets really worried, and we know how protective fathers can be of their daughters. He catches, actually catches them in flagrante delicto. He's, it's not like he, he wasn't fishing when all of this happened. He was actually, who knows what he was doing. Um, and he may be caught them at the river or something like that. Maybe caught them um, having a picnic by the river or or having a, a, a what do you call it, a, a smooch by the river. And then um, when she came back, he shot her or whatever, or he ran back to get his gun or whatever. I don't know, you know, whatever the scenario is. I do think it's interesting that it feels like Vincent was in a state of semi-undress when he was shot because there's no bullet through his shirt and, um, you know, I, I think that's definitely interesting. Stephanie says rendezvous. Um, Corporal Deb says because Vincent had syphilis and was a failure in Dr. Gachet's eyes. Um, bear in mind, Vincent, like the artist, I think um, Dr. Gachet tolerated Vincent because of his own selfish conceits, his own 
desperate need to become a, an artist. So he recognized that Van Gogh could paint, but I don't know if he really thought that much of him as a person. Bear in mind, there's this dude coming into your house with an ear missing. It's like, um, not like damaged goods, but it's like he's also come from an asylum. And this dude's now becoming friendly with your daughter. It's like, I want you in my house to teach me how to paint, hands off my daughter. But it sort of starts off as, can I paint your portrait? Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm flattered. Can I paint your daughter's portrait? Yeah, 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 that's great. And then something starts happening between the artist and the daughter. And the books he's reading right then, the books Vincent van Gogh's reading, are about relationships developing between artists and their muse. It definitely does happen. Um, so anyway, Bailey writes here that um, this idea of a romantic thing going on, you might say, cheap as Nick, uh, you know, um, 130 years later, you think that this could have happened. Actually, people have been thinking about it for 50 years, since 1969. So I don't know about the villages. I don't know what the villages were saying prior to that, but it says here, this idea was proposed by the Van Gogh specialist, Mark Trelbeau, in 1969, who described it as an old rumor. So the way I understand this, in 1969, so 80 years after Van Gogh's death, um, this specialist describes this as an old rumor. So it's not like it's, a, it's an old rumor now. It is an old rumor now. It is an old rumor in 1969, which means it was probably a rumor before that. And wasn't that rumor needing to be dispelled by the gachets? Instead of Vincent was in love with Marguerite, Marguerite was in love with Vincent. Uh, so what... What link did that have with the circumstances of his death? No, no, no. He committed suicide and he did it far from here. He did it behind the chateau. Okay. So anyway, it says here, he quoted Madame Liberge, a local woman who claimed to have been a childhood friend of Marguerite. That's what Stephanie mentioned. The then elderly woman said that the doctor's daughter never admitted that she had fallen in love with the painter. But her whole, oh, here it is. her whole attitude and everything she told me betrayed her true feelings. This seems to, and then, thanks a lot for this, uh, Martin Bailey. He says, this seems to represent flimsy evidence of a thwarted affair. I don't know if that's flimsy evidence. I don't know if Marguerite's best friend, um, well, maybe not best friend, um, childhood friend, so it's just a friend, um, I don't know if you would say that her whole attitude changing, that betrayed her feelings. I don't know if you would say that's flimsy evidence. I mean, I yet in all the time in true crime where people say um, someone's effect means absolutely nothing. Um, someone showing um, no remorse when they should means absolutely nothing. People grieve differently it means absolutely nothing. To me, it's the opposite. Um, in the circumstances where somebody dies or somebody's missing, if you're not showing, if you seem not to be behaving properly, can be um, the strongest evidence, and I don't mean it's scientific evidence, but the strongest sign that something is wrong. And sometimes we do misinterpret these signs. Um, there have been cases... Um, the Cleo Smith case is an example where you look at certain people and they, they do behave oddly and it is not, um, at the end of the day, suspicious behavior. Um, there was another case where someone, um, a baby was kidnapped and the, the, the dude involved in that didn't seem to act, uh, he just seemed a little flippant and and nevertheless, he, he wasn't actually um, involved. Um, so you can, you've got to be careful by judging from effect alone, but you've also got to be careful to say it's absolutely irrelevant or it's flimsy evidence. So this is actually a huge indicator that reinforces this theory. The fact that you've got a person 
a contemporary said, I noticed that Marguerite's behavior, that her, that she changed. And I, I suspect that she was in love with Vincent. So now you've got a, a third party, a kind of an independent person who's adding substance to an already substantial theory and one where the, the ends are starting to knit together. And I've always said, when you have a theory in true crime, um, you'll tend to notice as you go further and further and deeper and deeper into it, you'll just stumble upon things that strengthen that theory. And that's a good sign. That means your, your theory is um, uh, authentic or it's based on reality. When you have a theory that's totally unrealistic and ultimately um, didn't happen, you won't find those things. And so you can imagine then you'll come up with another theory and another one. Um, a theory that is grounded in reality, you'll find reinforcement for in all sorts of different places. And in the end, you'll end up with an integrated story. You may not have all the details, but you'll have a lot of them. Um, so he goes on to say, so now, now, um, Now Martin Bailey is actually playing the part of like a defense attorney. He's basically saying on this charge that Marguerite Gachet was suspected to be in an affair, I'm now going to make the following defense. I'm going to defend I'm going to defend that scenario, right? I'm going to um not defend this, that scenario, I'm going to defend my position on that scenario. So he says, would Marguerite, who would have just celebrated her 20th birthday, I actually think it's the 21st birthday, um, I could be wrong, would she really have been attracted to a socially awkward 37-year-old man who had, a mutil who had mutilated his ear and had just emerged from a year in a mental asylum? Even if Vincent had been attracted by a youthful beauty, I think he was, surely he would have realized that any signs of his intentions would be spotted and rebuffed by Dr. Gachet, with whom he wished to maintain good relations. Van Gogh had spoiled many good relations with affairs and with um, objectionable relations, relations with the opposite sex, including with his own parents, including with... The, pari the parishioners in his parents' um, town who weren't very happy with what he was doing. So this idea that he was going to respect his relationship, Vincent wasn't really that kind of guy. Um, and then this is quite a good point. He says, if the doctor had suspected anything, would he ever have allowed his daughter to pose? Well, I've got a counter argument for that. Maybe he didn't suspect anything at the time that she first posed. We know that he wanted her to pose again. And maybe in the interim, the doctor did feel like, okay, I can see something's going on here, not only with him, but with her. You're not posing for him. And now Van Gogh is now peed off. And now Vincent, now, now the doctor's like, you're not posing for Vincent. Vincent's not very happy. She's not very happy, and maybe they've now got to run off together for for little chats, you know, like maybe we can get your dad to let us do this, and maybe that's sort of how it starts. Dad disapproves, now you've got to start doing things sort of secretly, but the, this, this idea of she wants to pose for him, he wants to paint her, and through that they actually have this sort of little kind of like delightful little dalliance together. Maybe they don't even kiss each other, but maybe there's this sort of fun thing of um, giving their dad the runaround. And, um, you know, maybe it's like this fun sort of game for her and maybe for him it becomes something that uh, he misinterprets ultimately. Maybe he thinks her friendliness is um, flirting kind of thing. Um, but maybe it is her fault that things go the way that they do in, in terms of, um, she makes herself to some extent available to him and he um, 
totally crosses a line kind of thing. And so it's obviously more his fault, but anyway. Um, I've, um, I, I have a counter-argument to what Bailey says. So, so, so he's arguing that, first of all, this is age gap, and I agree that's certainly relevant. I'm not saying it's irrelevant. But in a, another sense her youth makes her more attractive to him than if it was, say, someone, um, uh, let's say, another 37-year-old. Um, he, he would have found her, even if she wasn't that attractive anyway, he would have found her quite attractive given her youth. Um, but in addition to that, he's... Um, so her youth may also have made her naive and also, you know, you get that thing where young people are quite sort of foolish in terms of their choices. I'm talking about both sexes, men and women. When you're young, you might choose, you might fall in love with your teacher or um, somebody and it's, and it's a bit irrational, it's a bit illogical, but nevertheless, you've got these feelings. Um, I think even Anne Frank talks about... Um, these strong feelings that she develops in her diary of Anne Frank. I mean, I don't think it's rocket science to say this, but I do think a young woman, especially in that time, um, maybe she even read the book that Van Gogh gave her father about the muse and so on. Maybe she imagined herself in that sense. And maybe it's quite a romantic way of thinking about the whole thing. Um, I, I think the question isn't so much like what Bailey thinks about this or what you think about this, but what did Marguerite as a 20-year-old who probably didn't have much experience with the opposite sex anyway? Because, I mean, she didn't ultimately get married. So you kind of get the idea that she was quite closeted, um, that she was quite overprotected by her father because her mother died also. She may have been overprotected not only by her father but by her brother as well, right? And it was probably quite a paternalistic society, so she's being told what to do not only by the men in her family but by, by male figures in general. Um, and so she doesn't have a mother figure also to take her out of that scenario, to say stand up for yourself um, or whatever. Um and she does have access to Vincent van Gogh because he's coming around quite often and often when her dad's not there. He's got to go to Paris to, to work on his profession. So she unexpectedly has this experience with a stranger who does turn out to, bear in mind, he's a foreigner. He's a guy who comes from the Netherlands. Um, he's a talented artist. And this is where I think it's really interesting and where I think Bailey fails to understand the character of Marguerite in the same way he fails to understand the character, in my opinion, of Vincent van Gogh in the same way that he misunderstands other characters. And it's to say the following. Her father, Marguerite's father, was eccentric. Her father, Marguerite's father, was interested in becoming an artist. Now another figure comes along who's almost like a father figure in the sense that his brothers just had a baby and, and so you have Vincent um, in a charming way taking care of his newborn nephew and she sees that. And so he's almost like an uncle, like a father figure, but is even better than that because even her own father respects his talent and invites him into their home and accepts him but doesn't really get to know him and the getting to know him is left to her where she would maybe give him dinner or poses for him or whatever. And this thing that her father's always wanted to be, Vincent actually is. And, and it's this weird thing of Vincent actually is a really good artist or a, yeah, he's a pretty good artist, but he's unable to sell his art. And so he's struggling financially. Her father's a terrible artist but he's not struggling financially. So you've got this weird thing. And she may have been sensitive to that strange irony. And I recommended to my patrons watch The White Lotus. It's a really interesting um, series. I think it's on HBO. 
um, with the, these dynamics between all these different people. Well, one of them is this um, uh, woman who who's sort of a, a friend of, of um, this sort of white family, and she gravitates away from them while she's there to another Hawaiian dude and um, just gets this very deep sense of love and knowledge for his circumstances. And she falls in love with him and things go badly wrong and, and a crime uh, results from that. But in part, the crime results from a, a deep connection to this person that she falls in love with, but also his circumstances. And so didn't that happen with Van Gogh? Didn't that happen between Marguerite and Van Gogh? And if anything, her father disapproving may have incentivized the relationship as often happens with those young love type, you know, if a parent disapproves of it, then it becomes forbidden and then the forbidden fruit becomes even more tasty, doesn't it? Anyway, um, uh, What else is there to say? Um, it could also have been that she initially felt sorry for him. Um, the mutilated ear, him being in an asylum, she may have felt like, she may genuinely have felt like, um, you know, this guy's, a, she sees more of him than almost anyone else. She She's alone at home and everyone else is busy with their lives. And then he comes around there and he quietly paints her and he paints the garden. And she may have felt a sense of his loneliness through her own loneliness. She's lost her, her mother. Um, and, um, and she may also have felt almost a sense of understanding her father better through this artist. Uh, actually says women were property Axie says, I think she identified with Van Gogh. Um, Nisi says, we women tend to think we can fix. Corporal Deb says, I think back then women were treated very differently, more like objects. So quite a few interesting comments. Nisi says, a fun tease among each other. But you can definitely see in a scenario where an artist is painting a young woman you know, a young a young woman that's at that age where they are becoming sexually mature, but like in a how can I put it in a in a normal way. I mean, you can sexually mature prematurely or or whatever. Um, if she's turning twenty or twenty one, she's really coming into a full. Um, sexual attractiveness, if I can put it that way. You know, the the spring is springing around in our ways and this young woman is also um, um, in a way in the springtime of her life, if that makes sense. And Van Gogh is kind of coming out of the winter of his own life, right? He's coming like out of like this long, dark winter of his life and he's experiencing the springtime of this young woman. And so just in the scenario of an artist painting a young woman, a male artist painting a young woman, a male artist who's attracted to women, um, you can see a scenario that something can develop. And when you look at what he is reading at the time, you can absolutely see what he was likely thinking at the time. You don't even need to know that. You can go and look at his other relationships that he had muses in the past that he either pestered or that he that he that he had relationships with it he did do it in the past and he raised a lot of eyebrows in the past with his attempts at relationships with a cousin with a prostitute i think with a neighbor and so on and so on um that's a story on its own that's that's a follow-up book i've always meant to write the mistresses of vincent van gogh that's the untold story you hear about vincent van gogh the troubled artist vincent van gogh the Mad artist, but you don't really hear about Vincent van Gogh the lech, Vincent van Gogh the frustrated bachelor, Vincent van Gogh the uncle whose brother has just gotten married and has a son and he is the older brother 
and he spent a year basically like in jail. Um, and he's now in this wonderful countryside town, and he wants to live, but he and he probably wants to get laid. Um, you know, he is used to going to brothels. He hasn't done that for a long time. He's used to drinking. He hasn't done that for a long time. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, actually says, to be a great artist, muse, a huge magnet. Um, I can tell you there's a period, remember, I'm an investigative journalist. Um, there was a period where I was more a photographer than a journalist. I'm right now more a, a researcher and, and a, yeah, a researcher and an investigative journalist than a photographer. But there was a time where I was a more photographer and there was a time where I photographed beautiful women, um, sometimes for magazines, sometimes for for newspaper articles, sometimes for um, their own portfolios. And and I had a, a girlfriend, I had a relationship of about a year or two with, um, I'm just trying to think whether I photographed her first. I th well, 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 I don't know if it's fair to say, because I think the, the relationship sort of predated the photography, meaning... Um, I think we were already going into a relationship and then we, we sort of had a photo shoot. But the photo shoot definitely accelerated that. Um, but I've definitely been in situations where there's been kind of chemistry as the photographer. Things haven't necessarily happened because I've tried to, I've tried to be a professional in that respect, but you've definitely felt something going on and it's happened more than once. And so I can attest to how powerful that experience is. Someone's almost performing for you and and they're trying to express their beauty but also accept their beauty and experience it and someone else is actually doing that at the same time. And it's this powerful experience and it's a beautiful experience and it's a, a shared thing. And, um, you know, they various iterations of it can be creepy and someone might be uncomfortable, but can also be um, the stuff of uh, fantasy, the stuff of um, fairy tales, or whatever you want to put it. Um, and so you can absolutely see that being the case here. Bailey doesn't want to really go there. Bailey's saying, no, 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 there, there was an age gap. Um, and so I've actually written here that, that he's made a poor argument. That's my assessment. You might say, no, I agree. I don't think that something did happen with them. My assessment is that I think this is a poor argument. I said that Van Gogh was like her father, and she was also perhaps quite like her father. Um, uh, her father was eccentric. Van Gogh was eccentric. Perhaps she was also quirky to some extent. Um then um, at the bottom of page 168, talks about the outbreak of the Second World War, the collection coming under threat. Um, and then it says that uh, Paul Gachet Jr. took the Van Goghs off his walls and hid them in a secret void, which had been carved into the cliff at the back of the house. And I find that really incredible is that um, now you have absolute disclosure of this this guy keeping something secret, protecting something. And what does he do? He takes the paintings off the wall and he hides them in the in like a secret corridor, a secret cave in the back part of the garden. And remember I told you that the garden backs up into kind of like a graveyard, right? Um, and sometimes bones would sort of roll out of there. But um, um, I've taken photos of that section of the hillside and it is very porous, meaning there are sections where there are sort of big uh, sort of rocks and then there's sections where it feels like you could sort of go around the side. And it seems like some people have turned some of these porous sections of cliff into 
almost like garden sheds. Like you can put some of your garden implements in there. Some people have turned it into sort of like a um, visiting area, you know, like an area where you can sort of almost like sit in the garden, you know, so you've got a roof over your head, but the exterior of the cave looks out into the garden. Some people have turned it into like a stable scenario, you know, like you keep some animals there. You might allow chickens, that's where they sleep at night or whatever. Um, but in a scenario like that, you can also imagine in Gachet's time, what was what were these cave-like areas used for? Is that where they kept their menagerie of animals? And in any event, in a scenario like that, could that have been where Vincent and Marguerite sort of consorted? Did he help her feed the animals or did, did um, they do their little um, uh, pinching and flirting in the dark of the caves? Is that where they went in order to, you know, do their little, you know, uh, secret um, romance stuff? Where did it happen? What could have happened in that sort of area? Um, and if it was um, sufficiently separate from the house and secret, you could have a scenario where you start taking your clothes off because you're private enough, and in that situation maybe he was caught out by somebody else. It is quite interesting, this idea that the Germans are bombing Europe and so, and bear in mind Van Gogh's Yellow House was actually bombed. It was destroyed by German bombs in all that's, that's in the south of France. So the, the Yellow House doesn't exist anymore. So there was a real threat to Van Gogh paintings being, and yeah, um, a lot more than that, being destroyed. And so um, Paul Gachet took his... Van Gogh paintings off the walls because there was this chance that a German bomb could hit Orvez and, and not only destroy the paintings but destroy the house and the village and whatnot. Uh, it kind of puts into perspective what's happening now somewhere else in the world, doesn't it? I actually saw a clip somewhere where they spoke about the art in the museums in Ukraine and how they have taken also those artworks off the walls and hidden them in basements, the same thing. Um, then it says, by the end of the war, old age was creeping up on the Gachet household. Gachet's wife, Emma Lien, died in 1948, so, and his sister the following year. So it's quite interesting also. So you might say that um, either, you know, whatever happened was innocent, or you might say that, in other words, you might say... Um, Paul Gachet was doing something with the knowledge of his sister and the knowledge of his wife, and they were partners in crime. Or you might say they didn't really know what he was doing. He was doing his own thing. He 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 um, uh, he was wheeling and dealing, and they didn't really know what he was doing. But I, I think what is interesting is that his wife dies in 1948. Marguerite dies in 1949 and then what does he do now that they are and uh, excuse me if it sounds callous to say that but now that they're out of the picture does he do something different does he do something drastic right so with both of his family members um, not there to look over his shoulder or to say something what does he do now that it's only up to him what, what he's going to do so in other words ultimately the, the legacies left to him. And bear in mind, suddenly in 1950, the Van Gogh thing went nuclear. It sort of, um, you know, Lust for Life came out and it's in the 1950s that everything kind of exploded in terms of Van Gogh's legend. And that was preceded with the death of Paul Gachet's wife and his sister. I just think that's interesting. Um And so even Bailey writes here, although, although Paul Gachet remained in good health following the death of his wife and his sister, 
he, he says, Bailey writes, um, at this time, he reconsidered the future of the collection. So that is exactly what, exactly, almost exactly what you'd expect is what happens. His sister dies, his wife dies, and suddenly it takes a drastic move with his collection. Then it says, they took the, dis he says, um, I'm not quite sure what the source of this is, but um, he says um, he consulted his fragile sister months before her death and then took the generous decision to donate works to the French state. This was arranged with the Louvre's curator and his successor. So in other words, right at the time that Marguerite dies, there's this massive donation, that's, that's, the, word, that's the word that's used, uh, a generous decision to donate to the French state. And now, now this is where I think it's quite interesting. Do you really think after everything that has happened, after all that has gone into, um, you know, you take a picture and you sell it to um, this art dealer, you sell the uh, Marguerite Gachet at the piano to um, the Basel Kunstmuseum, do you really think, and that was in 1934, do you really think like 16 years later, you just donate the art that you have. You just sort of give it away for free. Uh, I don't. I don't want the money for this. I, I'm generously giving you all of this art because I I can afford to. Because I'm a nice guy. Do you really think that is what happened, or do you think this extremely valuable art was purchased by the French government for a crap load of money? Did, which Which one do you think is true? It says here, now we're on page uh, 169, it says here, in 1949, Gachet Jr. and his sister gave their two greatest Van Goghs to the Louvre, which then displayed modern paintings in the nearby blah, blah, blah. It says, um, and these were the self-portrait with a swirling background. That's a self-portrait. That's a really famous, this picture, right? That's a self-portrait with a swirling background. It's arguably one of the most important um, Van Gogh paintings that are out there. And then also the portrait of Dr. Gachet, meaning that second portrait of Dr. Gachet, right? Um, I think it's really interesting, and I could be wrong. So if... Martin Bailey was sitting opposite me right now. He might say, um, sorry, you totally on the wrong track there. But on page 169, he says, in 1949, Gachet Jr. and his sister gave their two greatest Van Goghs to the Louvre. The Louvre. Um, I don't know if I agree with how that's written. I don't know if it's a case that Paul and his sister gave their... Van Gogh's to this museum. I would say in 1949, Paul gave these two really important uh, Van Gogh's to the museum. That's how I would put it, right? I wouldn't say Paul and his sister gave these artworks away. His sister hasn't really been involved in this whole business, but I think involving his sister in it makes Paul look kind of innocent. I do think it's really interesting that at the time that she's dying, that is when he disposes of these major works. Two years later, he offered church at Orvez, and there's a little bit of suspicion that that may not be authentic. I don't agree with that. I think it is authentic, but it is interesting that all this time, church at Orvez has been in... Um, Paul Gachet Jr.'s possession. That's the third picture that they that he disposes of. And he, he writes here, on this occasion, he received part of its value as a payment. So he seems, Bailey seems to be saying, the self-portrait with the swirling background and the portrait of Dr. Gachet, he kind of just gave away, right? That's what he seems to be saying. 
Then he, but he says, but in terms of Church of Orvez, he received part of its value as a payment. And let's see what that amounts to. Footnote 46. Church at, listen to this. Church at Orvez was valued at 15 million French francs. And Gachet Jr. was paid 8 million. Although the Musée de Orsay website records that the financial contribution came from an anonymous Canadian donation, it was from New York-born Princess Winaretta Singer Polinia, who lived in England. Um, so I don't understand that. I don't understand that he gives this painting to France and then it somehow seems to come from a Canadian in the records. I, I don't quite understand that. Um, but it does seem like it was worth 15 million, but they give him 8 million. Uh, and so now he's the hero. Um, they give him 8 million francs. Just based on that painting, he's now set up for life, right? He's, um, he's a millionaire now just based on the one painting. And he's given these other two paintings. Now, one wonders... What is that all about? Is Paul Gachet actually a, a wonderful um, benefactor of the Van Gogh legacy and he did an incredible job and he should be applauded? Or is what's going on a little bit of like um, kind of buttering up the French in the sense of I'm going to, I'm giving you these artworks, right? They're not actually his. He inherited them himself from his father. I'm going to give them to you, but actually not. You're going to buy them from me, and I'm going to get not not the true value. I'm going to get some of the money. To me, the fact that, to me, the, the whole question comes down to the question of what's the money train here? Um, does Paul Gachet benefit from Van Gogh's art, yes or no, after Van Gogh's death? That's the question. Then the answer is, well, in terms of uh, Church of Orvez, he gets paid 8 million francs. So the answer is yes, but it's so it's quite weird. Now, suddenly, he doesn't really want all the money that it's worth. Why? And isn't that to sort of say, no, I, I'm not interested in the money. I'm not doing this for money. I'm not in it for the money. Oh, no, you're not. Isn't this your job? Anyone else would be in it for the money, meaning um, if you're an art dealer and that's all you were doing, if you're an honest art dealer and that's all you were doing, why wouldn't you deserve to be paid what it's worth? So can you see this as weird thing where on the one hand you can say he's a really kind guy. He's actually giving away his and his sister's art, but he doesn't want any money for it. What a what a nice nice person! Wow, oh, but with this art, he, he does want some a couple of million. Um, thanks for that. Um, but you could also argue that how the Gachets got the art in the first place is it is it really right that they took it from his funeral? Did someone like say, "Yeah, take 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 these paintings"? And on the one end, you could say, "Yes, maybe Theo did say that. Maybe Theo did say." Um, you, you treated my brother, you should have, um, uh, let's say, three paintings or four paintings. But I don't think Theo said, oh, my goodness, you treated my brother, you're an incredible doctor, you, you saved his life, except he didn't. Take 26 paintings. Um, that, that is what your amazing medical intervention is worth. Please take take um, 26 paintings and and... Um, enjoy, right? I don't think he said that. So I kind of get a little bit of a feeling here that in the same way Marguerite gave away that picture for, uh, what is it, 315,000 francs or whatever it was, um, because he sort of had a bit of a change of heart later on. I wonder whether Paul didn't have a change of heart where he felt, although I'm giving this away and I'm getting a lot of money, I don't really want questions to be asked around why I'm doing this. I want to be seen as the hero here. 
I'm giving these pictures to the French government and I'm such an awesome dude. Don't ask me where I got these pictures and don't ask me how I got these pictures and don't blame me that I got them. My dad told me to get them. My dad said, hey, gather up these canvases quickly. Um, you know, like, try, try and take another one. I'll see if I can take these, right? And then uh, keep them secret, you know, keep them secret for a really long time because you're going to be asked again, how did you come in the possession of all of these Van Goghs? Oh, I took them at his funeral. You know when Van Gogh committed suicide, yeah? Well, I went to his funeral and then I just took all of them from the funeral. Wow, what a nice guy. What a good guy. What a generous guy. He goes on to say he also gave paintings by Cezanne, um, blah, 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 and then he included other Van Goghs. And then it says, in 1950, he donated cows. Van Gogh's painted version of a print after a picture. These donations doubled the number of Van Gogh's in French museums. So the, the paintings that the Gachets gave to French museums doubled the total number of Van Gogh's that they actually had. And this was in the 1950s when it was really worth a lot. Um, I, uh, I'm also not sure whether I believe that Cows, the painting Cows by Van Gogh is, um, is, isn't is fake. I'll try and put it up uh, for you so you can have a look. Do you think that Van Gogh painted this painting. Sorry, I'm just trying to put it out there. So do you think Van Gogh painted that painting? Any any thoughts on that? A uh, couple of you say they can't see it. Uh, Paddy says, I vote no. Uh, Corporal Deb says, looking. I don't know why you can't see it. Uh, maybe this will help. Do you want to try looking at this? That picture. Yvonne says, no, the line work is not the same. So Yvonne says, it doesn't look right to me. So. So here's a good example. Um, this is a picture Paul Gachet Jr. gives to a museum. And now there's a question, is it actually genuine, right? And if you read the Wikipedia article, I didn't write the article, but the article reads as follows. The Cows is a painting by Vincent van Gogh produced in July 1890. He died in July 1890. So, um, and it says, during his stay in Dr. Gachet's home. So in other words, he painted this painting during his stay in Dr. Gachet's home. So in other words, he, he painted it while he was at Dr. Gachet's home. It is based on an 1873 Paul Van Rysel etching. Gachet owned um, blah, blah, blah. So, so, yeah, you kind of got a, already a, um, uh, a link between Paul Van Rysel, I think, is um, either Dr. Gachet or Dr. Gachet's son. So what you've got here is the allegation who, 
who's Paul Van Rysel again? I think you know, Paul Van Rysel is Dr. Geshe. I can't remember who Dr. Geshe, uh, what his son's name was. It was something else, not not Paul Van Rysel. But anyway, so apparently um, Vincent copied an etching that, uh, in other words, according to this, um, Vincent Van Gogh went to Dr. Geshe's home painted an etching that Dr. Gachet painted of cows at his home. And this is one of the works that Paul Gachet Jr. gives to the museum. So why on earth is Vincent painting, copying a work of Paul Gachet's father? Like what on earth is going on, right? If you look at the artwork, um, the the elements of it that are Van Gogh-like, like it's quite thick paint, um, but the energy lines are wrong. The color uh, feels wrong as well. Um, the, what do you call it? The, um, um, the, 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 the way that the grass is um, a certain shade of green versus the color of the cows, to me, isn't quite the, the color palette that Van Gogh would use. Um, the cloud, sorry, the um, sky also doesn't look quite the color scheme that I would expect. It's just a bit garish in, to my mind. The other thing is there's a bird, uh, there's a bird in that particular image. And when you look at wheat field with crows, um, it, there's too much delicateness to that bird compared to the wheat field with crows birds. Um, and so, I don't know, the way I look at that thing, it doesn't look genuine to me, right? And so the um, thing in the uh, Wikipedia goes on to say the following. In 1954, when the painting was exhibited at the Musée de l'Orangerie, it sparked a violent controversy over its authenticity, led by a passionate Van Gogh lover, Louis and Frey, and widely reported by the press. Right, so it's not just me saying ah, it doesn't really look right and the circumstances are dodgy. You've literally got um, the art community that are really upset by this, and they're saying they say it sparked a violent controversy over its authenticity. People are saying this picture given by Paul Gachet of a Van Gogh is fake. We don't believe that it's true. Um, and it says this was also reported in the press, not like one freak saying, blah, 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 I don't think this is true. Even the media are reporting on it. Then it, it goes on to say, as with other works in the Gachet collection, it continued in the following years it meaning this controversy over authenticity continued in the following years and has not yet died out, right? Meaning this feeling of suspicion continues to the present day. Then it says, however, the laboratory examinations that were carried out did not reveal any clues that would make it possible to consider a fake. In other words, they went to a lab and they looked at the type of paint used and they looked at the type of canvas used and they said, well, based on that, it seems like it's genuine. Now, the problem is, didn't Vincent van Gogh paint at the gachets? Didn't he leave his paints at the gachets? Didn't they use the same canvases, right? In other words, would it be that hard to um, paint a fake but using his materials, right? And then goes on to say, according to Anne Distel, it is more likely to be accepted for a minor work by Van Gogh, perhaps a study for a painting he had in mind, produced in the exceptional circumstances of the end of his life in Norvez. The other thing is, I don't think Van Gogh ever mentioned painting cows in any of his letters. Uh, I could be wrong. I, I just don't remember it ever coming up that he said to his brother, um, Hey, Theo, I painted some cows, pretty cool, whatever, nothing like that. So that's another reason to dispute it. And that's another reason why those disputing this would say um, 
there's a problem because there's nothing to back it up. It just comes out of nowhere. And once again, this is associated with the gachets, right? Once again, this is an artwork apparently painted by um, Dr. Gachet, and now it's, you know, it's a copy of a painting by his father. And so in a weird way, you could have the non-existing Vincent van Gogh painting a picture drawn by Paul Gachet, Dr. Paul, Ga Dr. Gachet, and then his son retasks it as a painting by Van Gogh, and that's how his father gets to have a painting in the in the Louvre. Does that make sense? In other words, you sort of, by hook or by crook, get your father's painting idea to end up in a museum, right? Okay, so um, isn't that interesting? And, of course, uh, unless I've missed something, I don't know whether it comes up in the chapter fakes, but it doesn't mention anything about the cows being fake here. Uh, maybe it does mention it later, but we're not dealing with that now. So let's just go on a bit further. Um, um, so... Bailey himself says, Gachet Jr. suffered scorn for hiding the collection and there were even suggestions that some of his paintings might be fakes, right? That, that is Bailey himself saying this. And I've, I've, I've kind of maintained all along that this is a suspicious character. And now you've got the mainstream art community saying the same thing. All of his donations were exhibited, making the Gachet collection internationally famous. And now, bottom of page 169, with the donations, Gachet Jr. also broke his lifetime silence about the family's links with Van Gogh and the story of the collection. So think about what we're talking about. Um, this legendary secretness, this, this hermit of Orvez, this guy who keeps the gates locked, who doesn't want to talk to art experts. When it does come out, there's this huge controversy. There's this violent um, controversy, right? When it does see the light of day, there is this sense of distrust from art experts and from the media and from the public. And not only then, not only that, um, with his wife now deceased and his sister deceased, he now finally breaks his silence about, these are um, Bailey's words, Gachet Jr. also broke his lifetime silence about the family's links with Van Gogh, but when does he do it? After these two family members have died. There's now no one to contradict what he's saying, so he can, he can spin the story any way he wants to. And he says, between 1952, remember his sister died in 1949, between 1952 and 1954, he wrote a series of booklets and in 1956 went on to publish a book um, focusing on his father's autism. Wow, so I seem to be back. Sorry about that major break. I really never, something like that's, Happened before, but never quite as um, bad as that. Um, can you guys see me? Can you guys see me? I'm, I'm back on. I see there are only two people left here. I don't know whether I must carry on. Axi, are you are you able to see me there? Still buffering slightly. Nisi says, "Thanks, Nick. Fabulous night as usual. So appreciated." Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, to me, I need to actually look at this book. There's, there's really not that much left to go through, so I'm going to try and wrap up here. So, yeah, I was talking about um, 
Geshe Jr. breaking his lifetime silence, and, and the time that he does it is really interesting. He does it after the death of his wife and, and, and sister, and then suddenly he gets really active. Suddenly he writes lots of uh, booklets and brochures. He writes a book. Why doesn't he do this while they're alive? And also you have this mismatch between him being super secretive and then suddenly um, he's not. Suddenly he is writing books and, and, and telling stories. You also have this weird thing where he um, keeps stuff a secret and then when, he, when it does come out in public, there's um, there are questions around it. And so you can kind of see why it needed to be kept secret because there are problems with it, right? Um, Timmy, can you get off me? Because <laughs> I need to read this book. Well, can you lie down? Hey? Can you lie down, Timmy? Can you try and... There we go. Okay, so hopefully you can stay comfortable like that. Um, so now we're on page 170, and uh, uh, it says, Do uh, Gachet Jr. died in uh, 1962. Um, he'd still not succeeded in publishing the magnum opus on Van Gogh's period in Orvers, a, ta a task which he had taken over from his father in 1909. So his father had started writing a book about Van Gogh, and he taken it over and he never actually got it done, which I think is quite interesting. I think it was so difficult keeping the story straight and getting everything kind of on track that they actually ultimately failed to, to do it. I also think it's quite interesting. Dr. Gachet and his son are sort of like uh, wannabe artists. Both of them failed at being artists as far as I'm concerned. And um, in the same way, they failed as being writers. They weren't people capable of creating something. They were only capable of being derivative, capable of, um, um, you know, uh, copying something and shaping it into something else. Um, middle of page 170, in the 1970s, the text was circulated to other potential publishers who all rejected it for unknown reasons, and it was eventually returned to Gachet Jr.'s notary. So in the 1970s, um, someone made an attempt to try and, you know, um, push on the Gachet story, and nobody was interested. By this time, Van Gogh was famous, but no one was really interested in it. I think that's also quite interesting and, as far as I'm concerned, appropriate. Now we're on page 171. The remnants of the Gachet family collection um, have been dispersed in a series of auctions. Over a thousand prints, ranging from 16th century works to those etched by Dr. Gachet, were sold off. By the way, I don't believe any of the etchings that come from the Gachets attributed to Van Gogh are real. I don't think any of those etchings are genuine. Um, and yeah, he talks about over a thousand prints. Um, then midway through page 171, quote, despite Gachet Jr.'s generosity to French museums, suddenly is very, very generous, the long-term secrecy about the family collection and his awkward character help explain why he faced vilification in the art world with accusations about fake. So Bailey's kind of saying, I give you the benefit of the doubt. Bailey's kind of saying, even though he was so generous, um, because he was secretive, uh, that's why he was accused, that why was, that's why he was vilified. And so Bailey doesn't seem to see a link between um, the secrecy and the generosity. In other words, I'm going to be generous so that you don't hold, hold me in some kind of contempt. I'm going to be generous, generous, so that you are grateful to what I'm giving you and you're not going to think critically. You're not going to second guess what I'm doing. You're not going to ask questions. You're going to be, you're going to be like, oh, he didn't do it for the money. Um, he didn't even get any money for it. Or he only got half of what it was worth. He didn't do it for the money. Well, it, the secrecy was in order to avoid difficult questions. The generosity, I believe, was for the same reason. 
I'm being generous so that in a, in a weird way, I mean, ask the question, if you are so generous to the museum, the, 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 the artwork, let's say, is valued at 15 million and you say, give me half, aren't you in a way kind of buying a bit of, buying something from someone where I, I, I'm doing you the favor that you don't have to give me all the money that it's worth. You can do me the favor of supporting me. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. I will. That's a question. Uh, do you think that is what happened? Then bottom of page 171, Bailey writes, Bailey's accepting that there are serious reputational problems here. I'm not the one who's saying this. I'm not saying, I'm not, I didn't kind of invent it to support my story. It's part of the story. Page 171, Gachet Jr.'s reputational problems began soon after the end of the Second World War. So that's how long he's, he's had reputational problems. It's quite a long time, right? Um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's quite a long time. In 1947, the, a poet suggested the doctor should be held partly responsible for the artist's death since he apparently did little to treat him. So let me say that again. Let me read this again. Again, this is in Bailey's book written two or three years after I wrote my book. In 1947, that's like 75 years ago, right? A poet suggested that Dr. Gachet should be held partly responsible for Vincent's death because he apparently did little to treat him. In other words, then it was quite well known that Dr. Gachet didn't really do his job, wasn't very helpful, right? It goes on to say, a few years later, a naval officer and Van Gogh fan uh, wrote a series of articles saying that a particular etching of Dr. Gachet wasn't by Van Gogh but by the doctor himself. I believe that myself. I also think that that is true. Yvonne Phillips, thanks a lot for that, Yvonne. Yvonne Phillips says, what do you think happened to all the money they made? I mean, what, do you, what did they have to show for all the paintings sold? Well, I think the money is like in a family trust or family bank account. It's part of it's part of um, the wealth of a particular family. Um, and then I've and then I've we now on the the last two pages here. I've just kind of put these asterisks in line with the, the text. I'm just going to read that. Um, on page 172, um, Bailey writes, although Joe's son Vincent Willem continued to be friends with Gachet Jr., relations then soured badly. So I kind of also want to do like a woohoo because you one of your best arguments for... Um, one of your best arguments for, Nick, I think you are totally out of line here. I think you don't know what you are talking about, is if this is such a big deal, if the gachets are such crooks, if the gachets are not to be trusted, then who are you to say this and not Vincent van Gogh's family? Like why on earth would the van Goghs themselves not be like, we're not very happy with this situation? Why would the Van Goghs themselves tolerate talk about fakes and this and that and the next thing, the changing narrative? And so you'd be totally um, justified and you'd be totally right to say, I think you are talking absolute nonsense. Um, if this was a problem, you would definitely know about this from the Van Goghs themselves. They would dispute it. Well, there you have it from Martin Bailey, right, from Martin Bailey, saying that as early as the early 1950s, relations between the Van Goghs and the Gachets soured 
badly, not that it just went a little bit bad. They soured badly. And so you, you kind of have this situation, the scenario where Joe Van Gogh cooperates with Dr. Gachet. He wants to move the remains. He wants to do whatever. But she's not completely comfortable with it, but ultimately she assumes that he means well, just like Theo assumed that Dr. Gachet meant well. And ultimately there's a change in all of this perception that things are going on that we don't approve of. Other people are saying things and we're realizing we don't like this, we don't like that, and we don't like the way you are interjecting yourself into the story. It's starting, and not only that, it's, it's kind of in, inconsistent. Sometimes he says this, sometimes he says that. Um, I've written here the next asterisk, quote, Vincent Willem was beginning to feel increasingly suspicious about Gachet Jr.'s collection, which he suspected included fakes. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks a lot for that. So uh, I'm not the bad guy in the story. It's even the Van Gogh family that are saying we are a little bit weary about what is going on here. It is actually starting to look like it's quite suspicious. Thanks a lot for that. So um, it took a while. It took a while for them to kind of go, hmm. And I mean, the cow's picture that I've just showed you, that really feels and looks wrong. Intuitively, you can look at that and just go, that's not right. And that does feel like a gachet, you know, you get a masterpiece, well, that's a messy piece. Um, I've also, there's another asterisk here um, that Vincent Willem, so one of Van Gogh's descendants, even believed that the donated garden of the asylum was a fake which left a cloud hanging over the picture for decades. So here you've got the Van Gogh family accusing this wonderful benefactor of being a crook, right? And, and now there's this weird double reality with Van Gogh. It's like Van Gogh's art is awesome and it's an amazing story, right? That's the part of the thing. And then the other one is, okay, but we don't know if this artwork is fake or not. Uh, but it comes from the Gachets. Yes, but the Gachets is this. Yes, but Gachet gave us this amazing Church of Orbez. But but that, what's the story around that? Um, another asterisk. Um, in 1971, um, he made the astonishing claim that only two of the Van Goghs in the Louvre were authentic. How's that? So here you had a Van Gogh descendant making the extraordinary claim that, as far as I'm concerned, only two of these Van Goghs are genuine. In other words, the Gachets possibly were extraordinarily prolific in making fakes. And so the story of 70 paintings in 70 days is starting to feel shakier and shakier. I've also underlined here um, a Dutch specialist had always found Gachet Jr. difficult. And they talk about two authors of Van Gogh catalogues turned against Gachet Jr. Um, And so one of them, this Dutch specialist, went to visit Gachet Jr. at his home. You know, where he goes there, he goes to visit him in 1923, so 33 years after the incident. And Bailey writes the following, on that initial encounter, he was shown the paintings, but prohibited from photographing them for what was intended to be a comprehensively illustrated publication. So this Dutch specialist was trying to make a catalog. He was trying to record in a proper sort of format the uh, history of Van Gogh's art, the record of his art. And so Gachet Jr. lets him into the door, lets him see the paintings, but doesn't let him photograph them. Then um, I've written the word yes next to this with an exclamation mark. 
another asterisk, and this is um, sort of near the bottom of page 172, quote, as the years went by, this particular art expert became increasingly suspicious of the doctor's son, and in the 1950s, he revised his judgment on the second version of Portrait of Dr. Gachet, dismissing it as a fake. Woohoo! Thank you for that. Okay, that's my opinion. I didn't. I. I. I don't think I've read this before. Meaning, when I wrote my book, I hadn't seen this. I didn't see some art expert had said that. Uh, I just know that some people have expressed doubt, and I do too. So great. Even Martin Bailey, even this art expert Martin Bailey has written so many books on um, on uh, Van Gogh. Um, acknowledges that this art expert uh, um, dismisses this painting as a fake. The painting that, that where a picture of that painting appears today, right now, in Auvers, in front of Dr. Gachet's house, the painting of Dr. Gachet, um, there are art experts that believe that that is fake. So why is it still out there? So you have these, these um, contesting and contestable narratives and the problem is the narrative that is coming from the gachets. That's the problem. And so in, in the 1950s, 72 years ago, they're already disputing the second portrait of Dr. Gachet. As I said, I put the word yes here with the exclamation mark. Uh, and then interestingly, <laughs> in 1959, the editors of his revised catalogue in 1970 reversed this position, deeming the portrait to be authentic. In other words, the art dude who wrote this didn't change his mind. The editors changed his mind for him. Thanks a lot. So whatever this guy's opinion was in 1950, 20 years later, when it's become a crap load more valuable, oh, no, 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 it actually is genuine and now it is worth or whatever it's worth. Um, then I've also highlighted the following. Um, another author of a key catalog of Van Gogh's work also turned against the gachet is a guy called Jan Holsker. And this was in 1977. He described Gachet as a seeming, seemingly a reliable source. And then he changed his mind um, in 1996, so 22 years later, he changed his mind and he said he made a U-turn and in Bailey's words, castigating the doctor's son as totally unreliable. So he sort of starts off his position as, you know what, I think this guy's, um, I think he's a good guy. I think he's actually, we can take his word for it. 22 years later, you know what, he's totally unreliable. You know what, the fact that it took 22 years for this guy to figure this out is kind of scandalous. It's like, wow, it took you that long for the penny to drop, um, and this is your field. Mm. <laughs> Maybe you need to change your day job. Uh, Holsker died in 2002, age 95, and it says his criticism of the Gachet paintings is now being pursued by a different French writer. And so, so this guy took over Holsker's work. Um, apparently also has rejected a number of widely accepted paintings as fakes. And so he refers to uh, one of his books. So Bailey refers to one of his books, uh, La Affaire Gachet. I can't pronounce this. Uh, La, Ado La Ados des Bandits. It sounds like it's saying The Affair of Gachet, The Audacity of a Bandit. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation or, or um, in, uh, uh, translation. Um, but Bailey describes this as a polemic against the doctor. So somebody writes a book basically accusing, blaming the doctor. And, and there's a footnote here, 64. Let's see what that refers to. I don't know why um, Bailey doesn't provide the translation for some of these book titles. Um, 
So number 64, oh, nothing there. Just, just, just okay. Anyway, um, we're almost done. So, so this chapter about father and son is hardly a chapter about this wonderful um, uh, relationship that the father and son have and how they continue the legacy of Van Gogh. Instead, it's filled with allegations of corruption. It's filled with suspicion. It's filled with strange behavior. It's filled with inconsistent behavior. It's filled with problems, in other words. And this, this chapter is coming to the end of the book, uh, Van Gogh's finale, right? And um, even Van Gogh himself said, this guy is sicker than I am, meaning Dr. Gachet is not to be trusted. Where do you think that came from? Where do you, where do you think the idea for that came from? Um, then I've underlined two more things on page 173. For the 1999 exhibition, seven of the Gachet Van Goghs, and I think that is just such a great way of describing it. Um, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about Van Goghs or Gachet Van Goghs? What are we talking about? Are we talking about a painting by Vincent Van Gogh or are we talking about a Gachet Van Gogh? And there's something funny but terribly, frustratingly, horribly um, kind of ugly about that, that, that aspect to it, that, that someone has been praying, profiting, um, deceiving, whatever, whatever they were doing, um, and how it all started was at at Van Gogh's funeral, where Van Gogh didn't give um, them, he didn't personally give them these artworks, they took it. Theo didn't personally hand all of these artworks to them, they took it. The doctor didn't actually save his life. It seems like um, he could have either have murdered him, but if he didn't murder him, he didn't even try and rescue him. Um, what is said in the narrative is that when, when Dr. Gachet arrived at Vincent's bedside, he said there's no hope and he left. He didn't try and save him. He didn't, as a doctor, really attend to him. He did more after Van Gogh was dead than when he was alive, by far. Um, anyway, it says, for the 1999 exhibition, seven of the Gachet Van Goghs were subjected to a detailed examination at the research laboratory of the Musées de France. So there's also an article about this. So as late as 1999, seven Gachet Van Goghs are now being investigated, are being examined, because it's now so serious that even the museums are sort of compelled to figure out, has there been some mischief here or not? Right, that's the level that it is. Not with one Van Gogh, not with two, with seven. And then it says here, um, one of the paintings analysts found that x-rays showed that they had all the sureness of the artist's gesture. In other words, they did this examination, the museum undertook these tests and they kind of gave it the green light. They said, these are Van Gogh artworks, right? And, um, but then they also examined other artworks. Um, so they, they also examined art by Dr. Gachet. So they, they looked at paintings by Dr. Gachet. They looked at paintings by his son. And they concluded that none of these amateur artists could have been able to make credible copies of Van Gogh. They basically just felt um, they are they are not skilled enough to produce a fraud. You know, in other words, you are not a good enough artist to pull off a fake. You, you just wouldn't be able to. And I've kind of got a, a counter to that. The one is um, the cows is a terrible painting. It's an ugly painting. And so that fake is unsurprisingly fake. Right? It's unsurprisingly fake because it's, it's badly executed. It's painted by a non-artist, right? That's, that's, that's the one argument. The other argument is that this is not a scenario where you have time to, 
let me put it another way. This is not a scenario where you are um, just painting a painting and it's fake and 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 so you didn't have enough skill. You have number one, you've got years to paint and repaint and repaint and repaint and repaint until you feel that it's going to pass that test, right? So, for example, the second portrait of Dr. Gesha, I wouldn't be surprised if it, somebody painted it 20 times or 30 times. After the 30th execution, it was at a level that finally the, the fraudster felt was acceptable. And if you think about it, I wouldn't be surprised if the fraudster said, I can't get the, I'm not going to put the books in here. I'm going to take the glass out of it. And I want to take that out as well, just because I can't get it right. In other words, um, it was derivative and they also minimized some of the elements to make it easier for them because they literally couldn't get it right. Right. So um, I agree that the Gachets were crappy artists, but I think with enough time, even a crappy artist can practice the same thing enough times that he eventually gets some skill and can pull something off um, reasonably well, and but still not in a way that you're not you you're still going to be able to say that's fake, right? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm I'm saying bad enough artists that they could produce a fake, but not good enough that you would not see that it's fake. And that's the case with the second portrait of Dr. Gachet, in my opinion, anyway. Um, so he goes on to say, um, so Bailey's kind of defending the Gachets, which he's kind of doing throughout this chapter, he sort of pro provides um, critics and arguments and problems, and then he kind of tries to explain them away. Um, and part of that is, he says here, when they did make copies, he's talking about when the Gachets did make copies of Van Gogh's, we know that they did. In other words, the, the idea was that um, I'm just practicing my art, I'm copying a Van Gogh. I'm not, it's not fraud, I'm just, I'm just practicing, I'm, I'm just kind of training. Timmy, can I put you down? Hmm. Um, that I'm not. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm just kind of, um, you know, doing whatever. Um, so anyway, he talks about. I think I'm going to have to put you down, to me. Sorry. He talks about um, when they, meaning the Gachets, did make copies, meaning of the Van Goghs. They drew the outlines and then filled in the colors, rather like a child painting by numbers. Critics may well argue that the French Museum specialist had a vested interest in confirming authenticity. In other words, if you confirm it's authentic, then it's a valuable um, and relevant and real exhibition, if you say, oh, by the way, we're the museum and our experts say that's fake, well, then it's like, why do you want to come to our museum to look at a fake? Why do you want to Why do you want to have this big opening, this big exhibition, this big event, but that's a fake and that's a fake and that's a fake? Well, no, no thanks. I'm not coming to your museum anymore. So you do have a vested interest in that. Um, I don't know, I find this just quite comical. Um, if I'm understanding this right, Bailey's saying that the Gachets were so pathetic as artists that they would draw an outline and then fill in the colours like a child painting by numbers. In other words, they had absolutely no, literally no artistic prowess, no vision as an artist, no feeling of what they were doing, no sense of um, of, pers of the perspective of art. It's totally like, I want to be beloved as an artist. I want, I want all of the social um, perks. But in terms of the art itself, I'm a total 
idiot. I actually don't have a clue what I'm doing and I don't have a feel for it, but nevertheless, as a kind of a charlatan, I'm going to bully my way into it anyway. I'm going to be an artist. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I don't even have a clue how to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. I do think that this is a bit of an exaggeration, though. I think it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that they were so bad, they were like children painting by numbers, so they have no way of, um, uh, you know, painting um, Van Gogh. I mean, there are, there are paintings we've seen by... Um, there are paintings we've seen by um, Dr. Gachet and his son that are not that bad. I mean, this is a this is a this is a watercolor by Paul Gachet, right, Junior, of his father. It's not that bad, and so I, I would say that's an exaggeration to say it's like paint by number. So, um, although I, I mean, to me that's also like a terrible picture. He doesn't get the you know, he gets his father quite well. So anyway, the, so um, Paul Van Rysel is Dr. Gachet. Louis Van Rysel is um, Gachet Jr. Um, so that is almost it. There's just a last section to deal with here. Yeah, where it basically just says um, the... Um, the specialists that are employed by the museum have a vested interest in confirming authenticity. And that's just such, I mean, that is the story of Van Gogh as well. It's the story of Van Gogh is the story of Van Gogh because there's a vested interest in it. If you change the story, if you make it about syphilis, if you make it about that he's got a mistress, if you make it that he was murdered, the artwork becomes either less valuable or less esteemed or less respectable than this pure idea of a, a troubled artist um, struggling with his inner demons and pre producing these triumphant effervescent works of art. It becomes totally different when it becomes the seedy story of uh, an older dude preying on a young woman and all of that nonsense, right? Um So Bailey um, Bailey concludes by kind of saying it's been two decades since the Gachet exhibition and the, the technical examination. He kind of says it would be nice to do it once again. So he's almost like saying, um, you know, it's like if you think about it, 20 years go by and it's like – we, we're not going to talk about this again. That was pretty embarrassing. The fact that people were like, um, can you check whether this is the real painting? And when they do check, people are like, I don't know whether I accept that. I don't know whether I accept your assessment. It seems like you biased kind of thing. And so then they don't check again. And so a work like the second portrait of Dr. Gachet is officially regarded as genuine but it's unofficially not by, by many people. I'm one of them. Uh, he also writes that this time the Van Gogh Museum should be involved in the technical investigations. And then he, he talks about um, seeing the Gachet donation in context. So I don't know, as far as I'm concerned, although... Martin Bailey is to some extent fair and to some extent he um, addresses the problems with Dr. Gachet and he incorporates it in his narrative. I think he kind of gives them a lot of, I think he kind of gives them a pass. I think he kind of is quite kind and generous to them in, in how measured his criticism is. Um, I don't know whether he ever mentions Dr. Gachet as, as, a, as someone who could have killed him. I don't know if that's brought up ever in his book. I could be wrong. I may, may have missed something. He does talk about someone else saying that as a, as a doctor he was um, 
derelict in his duty, but I don't know if he takes it really further than that. Um, he does talk about it being murder in terms of murder or suicide, but I think he talks about Rene Secretan in that respect. Um, and then he does also acknowledge that there may have been an affair with Marguerite. That, that to me was quite surprising. That to me was quite a big concession that that is part of the... Um, uh, the um, I'm just trying to think, what are those works in the Bible that are not... What are those bi biblical work? What are those works that are not considered part of the biblical canon? Um, apocryphy, right? Is that the word? Um, I think it's apocryphal. Um, not sure if that's really the right word, but that uh, this thing with Marguerite is almost considered a kind of apocrypha to the Van Gogh story. It's part of the story, but it's not not considered officially to be credible, if that makes sense. Apocrypha, I think. Corporal Deb says that she thinks it could have been Paul Gachet that killed Vincent. So, so that is it. Um, I think the last thing I want to mention, I have highlighted other things, but the last thing I want to mention it's a really long live, despite that little interruption, um, that ends up um, it's almost three hours, 40 minutes. Um, so on page 188, he talks about the two versions of Portrait of Dr. Gachet have never been brought together since the day that Van Gogh worked on them in June 1890. That's quite an important point. The two portraits of Dr. Gachet have never, ever seen them side by side. Um, the second version owned by the Gachets was hidden away in their house until it was donated in 1949. So it was hidden away for 71 years, quite a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of done. Um, I just want to end off by quoting the very last words in Bailey's book on page 200. It's the very last sentence uh, on page 200, and I actually believe that the very last picture that he shows isn't authentic either. I don't, I don't think Van Gogh painted that either, but that's just my opinion. Um, so... He talks about, um, with Van Gogh's astonishing artistic imagination and determination, what could he have achieved? And what he means there is, he says, what if Van Gogh had lived, let's say, 10 more years, right? Uh, at the top of the page, he says, where might that have taken his art? He says something like... Um, so he says the following on page 199, he says, had Van Gogh realized that his work would eventually be appreciated, he might never have pulled the trigger, abruptly ending his career at the age of 37. He says, if he had continued, if Van Gogh had continued and enjoyed reasonable health, he could well have lived and worked for another 20 or 30 years. And so that's really where I want to end this off because next to that I've got a question mark and WTF, right? This idea that Van Gogh, if he didn't commit suicide and if he wasn't murdered, if Van Gogh somehow just lived on another 20 or 30 years, uh, can you imagine this incredible legacy? And I don't know how you can make that argument when his brother died six months later of syphilis. I don't think you can make the argument that um, if Van Gogh, if what happened on the 27th of July didn't happen, Van Gogh would have lived happily ever after for 20 or 30 years. I just don't think he could have made that argument, that he would have lived from 37 to plus 30 years, 67. I don't think he could have made that argument because he had syphilis, because like his brother, he had syphilis. And so 
if nothing happened, maybe Van Gogh would have lived another year, maybe he would have lived another two years, but with deteriorating health. And, and I would also assume if Theo died before he did, if Theo died in January, I don't know if Van Gogh would have lived much more than half a year or a year after his brother, because he would have lost his support system, not only in terms of moral support and family support, I'm not saying he would have lost it all, but he would have lost the primary support system that he had and possibly to some extent the person that was uh, taking care of him. And I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be surprised if his brother did die while he was still alive, that he would have, it would have pushed him over the edge in the sense of he would have, he would have returned to drinking he would have struggled even more with his art, and who knows? I don't think it would have been a situation of... So you must bear the following in mind. If Van Gogh survives this incident, his brother still dies. And so how does Vincent Van Gogh deal with the death of his brother, the most important person in his life? And the answer is it would have been devastating to him. Um, he may have continued to work the way he continued to work when he was in the asylum, but he probably would have ended in an asylum himself, um, struggling with probably depression, struggling with um, his own health issues. And so if he didn't die from suicide or murder, he probably would have died of syphilis within maximum five years, probably closer to two years, maybe even one year. So to make this sort of uh, this bring up this idea that if this didn't happen, he could have had this astonishing career. It's just totally unrealistic. You can make the imaginative argument that had you magically taken away all the obstacles, can you imagine what Van Gogh could have produced had he lived, if, if you could somehow conjure Theo back into existence and you could just somehow allow Van Gogh to just continue producing, that is certainly a fascinating question. And, 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 and unfortunately, the answer is simply, it wasn't going to happen, and it didn't happen, and it couldn't happen. But if you just imagine that somehow he was given 20 years to take the art that he had um, in 1890 further, you do get the sense, wow, it could have been incredible. I think the flip side to that is, if you have the story of Van Gogh, uh, Van Gogh's life somehow just unraveling in a natural and normal way, if you have his life unfolding in an ordinary way and he goes on and he meets someone and he gets married and he continues to paint and he paints this and he paints that, I don't think that that story gets him to where he is today. I think he will be seen in some way as a somewhat interesting artist with a somewhat interesting life and especially an interesting early life. But um, in terms of the full body of Van Gogh's work, fakes aside, um, his art isn't that great. Story Night's amazing, but it's a singular work. It's a singularly amazing work. There are a couple of his other paintings that I like. And then from there, it sort of fizzles. He's not a fantastic artist and he's not a fantastically skilled artist. He is a very interesting artist. His letters add incredible depth to his artist's journey. And that is actually what we celebrate. We celebrate the inner person to this outer veneer of imposter, of this um, energized landscape, but what we're really seeing when we see that energized landscape isn't the skill of the artist. We actually see the, um, the meaning and the depth of the journey that brought us that art, that, that art to us. And in a weird sense, we recognize our own suffering. We recognize our own journey. We recognize our own difficulty. We recognize the depth of the human experience. We also recognize the way the, um, the artist, the human being, interacts with the world, sees the world for the first time, is in the world, is part of the world, and at a particular moment in time. And also the way that the world changes 
a person, the way that the world, um, the energy of the world infects a person. And at times it's the cold light of day and at other times it is this um, pulsating, energizing um, force that is radiating into the human body like, um, like sunshine into leaves. You know, it is nourishing the human experience. And so you have these different things that are going on and we interpret it the way that we interpret it. But we tend to be biased in telling the human story. Human, bi <laughs> human beings tend to be biased in telling the story of human beings. Are we really telling the story of a human being, a guy called Vincent van Gogh? Are we really telling... Are we really telling his story or are we telling our version of his story? Are we projecting our story onto him? Are we really telling um, his story or are we telling his story based on our poor understanding of reality in terms of our own lives as well? In other words, the way we see the reality in his life equals the poor, our poor abilities to understand the realities in our own lives, right? And so we are artists of a, of a, of a sort as well. Uh, we are painting paintings of other people. We are painting paintings of ourselves. And how accurate are those self-portraits? And the answer is often not very accurate. How, how real are we about ourselves? How real are we about others? And so one of the great tests about true crime as a discipline um, true crime in terms of criminal psychology. Um, one of the things that I hope my work is going to change in the future going forward is this idea that criminal psychology is an incredible insight into the, into the science of man. Um, psychology is, but criminal insight takes you even further. We understand how we deal with anxiety and death and how we try to live at the expense of others and how we try and spin our own motives and rationales in a way that is supposedly reasonable, right? And it's in the criminal context that you really get these extreme um, thoughts and extreme actions that we're all capable of that really reveal the true human condition to ourselves and also our inability to see the true human condition for what it is. And so just in general, true crime is a test of your ability to see, uh, can you see when someone's not telling the truth? Can you see how much of the truth they're not telling and how much they are telling? Can you see through what they're saying to what really happened and how well are you able to see that? And if you can, you're a true crime rocket scientist. If you can, you become a true artist able to um, see reality. Just seeing reality is a rare gift. Reality has become kind of a precious resource. Um, you know, if you talk about Van Gogh paintings, one Van Gogh painting is the real thing and it's worth millions. In other words, the reality, just in terms of a Van Gogh painting, is worth millions and millions of dollars. A fake Van Gogh isn't real, but if you think it's real, it's also worth millions. But the joke's kind of on you, right? And if it turns out later that that is fake, someone's going to have to pay someone else back, as has been mentioned in the whole um, Nodler Gallery and, and the, the um, art fraud thing. So there's this thing of right now, what is real and what is fake? And to me, that is the great power of the Van Gogh story is for 132 years, we believed a particular story that just has seemed um, there's nothing to talk about here. There's nothing to see here. It's quite simple what happened here. And the, and the reality is, no, there are a lot of problems. No, what is likely something else happened. No, the person that Van Gogh was is different to the one that you think he was. And in some ways, he was a better person. Some ways, he was a, a better human being that, than people give him credit for. He wasn't suicidal. He wasn't depressed in the last month. He wasn't so lonely. He'd actually 
found a girlfriend, but in other ways it's worse. He had syphilis, he had inappropriate feelings towards the opposite sex, acted inappropriately, he had a drinking problem, this, that, and the next thing. And life is like that. In some areas, we are better than we give ourselves credit for, we, and other people as well. And in some ways, we are worse than we present ourselves to the world, we and others. And if you found this series, which is now coming to an ending, um, there will be like bonus episodes. If you found it enriching, enlightening, um, and you want some more of this stuff, try and get hold of um, the White Lotus series on HBO and look at the way that that artist with television interrogates um, the idea of, of, of living and life through his story of these characters going on holiday in paradise in Hawaii and how they sort of take their problems with them. They take themselves with them on this vacation. They take um, who they are with them. They're trying to escape the problems of life. They're trying to escape the all of that stuff. But they take it with them into paradise and then they, they try and resolve it. And what is so amazing about that series is a clever way that that director makes art with these relationships and brings it to a very interesting kind of resolution, um, how these people interact with one another and what they eventually take as their life lesson out of this experience of spending a few days on holiday in a while in this different context. And in the same way, you can look in on that work of art. It's really artistically filmed. The music's really done really, really well. You can look at that and say, what is my approach to myself? Um, what do I believe? Um, what do I stand for? Um, where do I fit in in this, this community of characters? Um, what am I going to take out of it? What I took out of it is, is don't sweat the small stuff. But equally, sometimes you do need to. In true crime, you absolutely need to sweat the small stuff into, in order to figure out what was the big thing that happened in the story. So, so that is my spiel. Um, Paddy, I want to thank you for, uh, I think, my biggest super chat ever, uh, $100. Thank you so much for that. Um, Paddy says, thank you from Paddy to Vincent van Gogh, Nick, and this TCRS group. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys being here and being interested. Um, as you've no doubt felt, especially in the last few minutes, um, it is very inspiring. It is very close to my heart. <clears throat> I'm getting kind of choked up. It is very close to my heart, but I also think it's really important it's very important in this day and age where we talk about fake news and is a, a war even real, is a pandemic even real, to engage with this idea of reality. And Van Gogh is quite a safe place to do that. We say, did this guy really kill himself? And the answer is, who was he really? Who he was is going to tell you kind of what was going on why he said what he did and why it happened, right? And we would ask these questions of ourselves as well. Who are you really? And if you don't like who that is, who do you want to be? Um, if you do like who you are still, who are you? Um, are, are other people around you getting your message? If not, maybe you need to change something. Um that's a thing that I, I struggle with is I may be happy with who I am, not completely, but in general, I may be happy with what I've achieved and what I've done, but am I happy about what the world thinks of me or, or what the world, um, where I am in the world kind of thing? And, you know, my, my validation story is a separate story, meaning um whether I feel validated um, by myself or whatever, that's a separate story. Is it 
troubling to me that that I'm not validated in the way that I feel I could be or should be. That is a, that is my struggle. That is my problem. And um, I don't know whether I'm going to solve it. At this point, it doesn't look like it. And in some way, I would have resolved that in some way. I've either got to let it go. I've got to find meaning in my personal life in a different journey, in fitness or whatever it is. Or I've got to say, you know what, this is really important to me. Being socially validated, being publicly validated in terms of my work, in terms of my research, in terms of books that I've written that are important to me, like the books I did on mass killers, Slaughter, that I think is one of my best books by far, and it's got sort of eight reviews and like three stars. The books that I put my heart and soul into that, that have just kind of been rejected, where people just are not interested in reading it. That's one of them. I'm pleased to say The Murder of Vincent van Gogh is another book that kind of got overlooked. And part of the reason for this series was to push, 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 so that it gets pushed into, gets brought to the fore, right? This book. Right? So so this book has kind of been um, brought to the fore by these 15 episodes. Part of it is because I would insist on getting that story out there. I care about the story. But part of it's also, um, what about all of the painful times that I spent trying to figure this out? I went to Oves myself. I had conversations with the Van Gogh Museum. You had people sort of treating you like Van Gogh was treated. You don't know what you're doing. you an amateur. You will never be successful. You don't know what you're talking about. You, Who are you in your life? You know, you, you're not married. You don't have children. You don't have a – you are you are not credible, right? And so you go through all of that difficulty and you feel like it's not fair. And so you're fighting against that and you want to eventually overwhelm the doubters, the dissenters. That's my struggle. And whatever you are in your struggle, you must acknowledge it and decide, am I going to take on the struggle or am I, going to, am I going to let it go? Maybe you need to let it go. Maybe I need to let it go. And I am starting to let it go. I'm not writing books anymore. Um, I'm, my work rate is dropping and my focus is to some extent on other things. So to some extent, I am letting it go. Should I be letting it go? Should you be letting go of whatever you should be letting go or should you be holding on to it? And that's why this series, The White Lotus, is such a good analogy to that because you might need to address something that you need to address that you've either forgotten about or you need to let it go. You need to say, don't sweat the small stuff or you need to actually start sweating this thing that you've actually been avoiding. You'll know what it is. The thing that you dream about often, repetitive dreams are trying to tell you something. Depression is actually a gift where it's a message trying to say, you are not honoring this thing that's so important to me. Please listen. Listen to this thing that is so important to me. Stop postponing it. Stop ignoring it. It's me, it's your inner child calling out to me, stop shutting me down. Honor me, listen to me, uh, acknowledge me, address me, all of these things, right? So in the same way with Van Gogh, we try and find out what is he truly feeling about his life, about how he feels about um, going out every day. What, what is he truly feeling about his daily experience? Um, that's important. It's important to know what that reality is, but so too in your life. What are you truly feeling as you go out every single day? Are you living creatively or destructively? Are you part of an escalating tension? Um, and if so, can you can you sort it out? Can you de-escalate? Can you find a way to a realistic fairy tale? Right. A realistic fairy tale may be just, um, anyway, I think I've said enough. I think you get what I'm saying. We're at the four-hour mark. I think it's a new record. But, I mean, part of that was from 
the whole line going out for about five or ten minutes. Suzanne Beck, Susan Becker, thank you very much. Uh, Van Gogh's legacy is so absorbing. Thanks, Nick. I learned a lot through your artistic telling. So that's my spiel. We might go into his letters at a later stage. Uh, I'm not sure when. Um, but uh, but that's it for now. There are a few little elements from, from ba Bailey's book that I still wanted to touch on, and we might do that on bonus episodes. One of them is when he talks about when he talks about finding uh, handling the gun that he says killed Van Gogh. That's something I wanted to talk about as well. So there might be bonus episodes, but probably not um, for the next month or so. I might do something on the anniversary of Van Gogh's death in July. So look out for that. But thank you for to everyone for joining me. I'm quite flattered and uh, impressed and surprised and happy that four hours in, there's still 46 people in. Um, thank you to you guys for participating. Uh, thank you to all the new members. Thank you to those for the magnificent super chats. I really appreciate it. And Timmy says goodbye. Timmy says goodbye. And uh, I think this is quite a good episode in the end, a good episode to end off with. So um, so thanks a lot for that. Um, I'll see you guys next time. You must enjoy the rest of your weekend. Okay, all the best. Okay, see you.